How's it going everyone? ND Sean 45 coming at you. As you guys can see, I am not alone in this video. I have a very special guest joining me. Um, and you know me, I take care of my guests, so I am giving him the full screen. I'll be right down here in the corner, as you guys can tell. But you guys have known for a while now that I've been wanting to get out, do new things. I've started doing the live streams. Well, now I'm going to give a crack at journalism and interviewing. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the ND Sean 45 channel for the first time. Uh, he is an author, a writer, and Catholic Christian militant. Please welcome Theodore Schubot. Ted, welcome to the ND Sean 45 YouTube channel. Thanks for having me on. Now, Ted, um, as I told you before, I've been watching you for a good four years now. Uh, when I first discovered you is when you called the uh, the 13 pro homosexual bakeries and that's when I uh, that it's just right there on the Illinois Family Institute there it was man calls 13 pro bakeries so I know about you very well but I'm willing to bet that the majority of my audience probably doesn't uh, so if you would Ted would you give my audience a little more insight into who it is that you are and what it is that you do well, my name is Theodore uh, Schubat, S-H-O-E-B-A-T, and um, I am a blogger. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, I like to consider myself a journalist sometimes, but I never went to journalism school. But I do like investigating things, and uh, I've investigated a lot of things, and that's what Schubat.com is for. Um, Schubat.com has been operated seriously um, since 2013, that's when we, that's when we begin to seriously write, and, um, well, a little bit before that, actually, I would say 2011, actually, but I, I personally began writing on that site seriously, uh, since 2013, and our goal really is to give information that people don't look at. Uh, about certain things so when you see something on the on the media that is the headline or when you see something on social media or YouTube or whatever that is a headline and everyone is talking about it we like to look at those stories and say okay well here's what you're missing you know oh this person that you really worship or this person that you really revere here is the reality on this person and that's what we have been doing for years and so that's that's really what we try to aim at at our website. We try to really spit, I don't want to use the word spit, but we like to reveal the idols of the masses. Yeah, and uh, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, you all, you do run the the website with your father, Waleed, and yeah. Andrew B. Azad, correct? Yes, there's three of us. And um, again, this, this is stuff that I would probably already know because I do watch you regularly, but... Your father actually is a, a, a Catholicism co uh, converted from Islam, correct? Well, he, he left Islam and became a Baptist in 1993. And then later on, he became a Catholic in 2013. Okay. And uh, were you yourself Baptist at one time, too, or, or have you always been a, a Catholic? No, I was born, um, technically I was born Muslim. Uh, but when I was three years old, my dad left Islam and became Baptist. So I remember going to the Baptist church in the 90s. Okay. And uh, in addition to that, um, and I guess, I guess I could have invited your father onto, the, onto this episode too if he, if, he ever, if he wanted to. Maybe that's something we can do in the future. But um, what, what was it for him and, and even yourself? Uh, what was it that brought you guys to Christianity? Like what started it with your father and made him, you know, what le what led him to the Lord? Uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but... Okay, that's fine. Um, my dad, um, let's see here. Well, he began reading the Bible, and he studied the Bible for a long time, for what now, say years, you know, months, and he began to see a tremendous, uh, and a tremendous difference between the Bible and the Quran, and it just had a very profound impact on him. Okay. So, 
make a long story short, um, you know, he saw, for example, in the Bible, the the intricacies of it, you know, the, the layers of history and it, the emphasis on geography, the emphasis on names and genealogies that you don't find in the Quran. And so there was so much complexity in the Bible and that that's something that's something that really impressed him. Yeah, cuz uh, I mean everybody has their different paths on on finding the Lord. I mean myself, I mean I told you before uh setting this up that I'm actually a, a Protestant and believe me I know how you feel about them, uh, particularly Lutherans. But I myself was actually Catholic for the first 7 years of my life. I was, you know, baptized in the Catholic Church and um but yeah, everybody def definitely has their own uh, different paths uh, finding the Lord, and I just you know I wanted uh, wanted to know what yours was and what your dad's was, and because it's not all the time that you see uh, someone who like your father was heavily rooted in Islam growing up. I'm sure you know finding finding the Lord and finding their way to Christianity. Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people like that, um, but you know when my dad. It's interesting. When my dad uh, first started doing this, it was in 1993, he started a website with a German engineer uh, by the name of Jochen Katz. I guess his last name was Katz, so he was... Meow. <laughs> Christians, but he was probably a Jew. Uh, <laughs> now that I look back and think about it. Um, but they started a website, um, and they called it uh, Answering Islam. And, um, you know, nobody cared about Islam at that time. That's the funny thing about it. Nobody cared about talking about Islam. I remember, you know, when my dad would go to the Baptist church and um, he would attend the Bible st uh, school studies and um, my dad would start telling people about the Islamic religion and people didn't know about it. People didn't really care. Um, people wanted to talk about the, the Catholic Church and how bad the Catholics were and how the Jehovah's Witnesses were there and the, how the Catholic Church was going to take over the world and blah, blah, blah. That's what people wanted to talk about. That's what people focused on. And, and um, people, a lot of people still focus on this to this day, actually. Um, but um, what was I going to say? You know, at that time, my dad would talk well, in, the, in the 90s and nobody cared about Islam. And then in 2001, you know, 9-11 hit, and then all of a sudden everybody started talking about Islam. And everybody was an expert on Islam. And all of a sudden you had people coming out saying, oh, I was a Muslim, now I'm a Christian. But frankly, some of those people were liars. Trying to avoid a like backlash that they might get in public, right? Well, no. Uh, they were trying to really benefit off of people uh, okay. by saying that they were um, they were Muslim but now they were Christian when the reality was that they were Muslim but now they were atheist but they I were see. Muslim, they were atheist uh, I can give you some examples of that Brigitte Gabriel is an example of that I know that she is actually an atheist but she tells everyone that she is uh, evangelical but she's not she's a liar she's actually an atheist in real life and I know this for a fact yeah, I actually, I actually remember you talking about her in a video, and you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, Ted. A lot of these people that I've heard you talk about in your videos before, like her and several others, which we'll get to later in this video, I never knew who they were until I heard you talk about them. So I think, I think that, I think that's something else that a lot of people could benefit from watching you and your father's website is, and that's not, that's not trying to make a promotional thing here, but it's very true. A lot you don't know really who the enemy is or who a lot of these people are until you find about find out about them through an unexpected source. But, but no, with with uh, what you were just talking about, I mean, I was I was honestly the same way. I mean, when two thought when uh, September 11th happened, um, I was a sophomore in high school, and I really had no clue what Islam was, and. But of course, you know, I, and I never really fell for anything. But you know, of course, everybody is putting the American flags out and all that, and trying to blame it all. Oh, all these people over in the Middle East did this and that, and then, well, you know, I never really got too involved. But I did see a lot of what you're talking about around me. 
So I know yeah. that I know that very well. Yeah, I mean, we, all, we, we all fell for it, you know. I, I fell for it at one point in time. I'll admit it. I'm not, I'm not proud to say it, but I did. You know, the whole thing with them, you know, waving the American flag and all that nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with waving the American flag. There's nothing wrong with um, with you know helping your country, but. The problem with the whole flag waving thing is it's it's really why people are doing it is the question that I always have. Like, if you want to wave your flag, that's fine. If you want to say that you're proud of your country, that's fine. But I always have to ask the question, in what context do you say these things? I have to ask the question, um, who's telling you to say these things? Or what person are you following? while doing and saying such things and, and oh, yes. having trappings of patriotism and all that because you know if you're I remember when I was a little kid in the 90s and we would go to um, every 4th of July we would go to this event in California called, uh, called the Singing Flag and the Singing Flag was an event where people would get together and you know thousands of people would get together and we would fire our fireworks and you know eat hot dogs and stuff like that mm. Well, nobody was telling us to do that, but you know, that, that it was part of a tradition, and and that's fine. Um, I have no issue with that. But then, if people are getting together for some weird, like Glenn Beck rally, and Glenn Beck is there, and they're all waving their American flags, and Beck is, you know, telling them about uh, how Jews and Christians and Muslims all worship the same God, or something like that, and and uh, they're talking about. Uh, you know, being proud Americans, I mean, I would have to question the validity of that event. Um, uh, if someone is, you know, getting, getting together for a rally for some politician, and this politician is telling you about the glories of America, but at the same time, he's getting paid off by, I don't know, some APAC funder or something like that, or APAC associated funder, and, um, this is a, this is a guy who is uh, part of the neocon lobby, and he's you know he has a past of telling people to you know bomb other countries or something. I would have to question the validity of that event. So I think we always have to when we look at uh, nationalist events, we always have to wonder what the context of the event is, why they are doing it, you know what's the mindset of the people there. That's always that's always what I ask myself. Well, and that's something that I've noticed too with, with things like that is, um, you know, the people that do that kind of stuff that put these events on and whatnot. I mean, it's very, it's very similar to what you're, what you're, uh, I remember you telling a story about going to the first, the, one of the first, uh, tea party, um, uh-huh. the tea party, uh, rallies or whatever you want to call it. And all the, all these people there, you know, you think it's this, this next big conservative party, but yet you see a bunch of people that, how should I say, aren't exactly conservative there. So it makes you wonder, like, the people who put these events on, what is the interior motive that exactly. that may not exactly present itself in the clear? Exactly. You always have to question the motivation. And, you know, if you're going there and you got some guy there who, uh, you know, is going to tell you about the glories of, American, of uh, America or something like that, and he's waving the American flag... Uh, but uh, you know he's he's uh, all for I don't know regime change in Libya or something. It's like, well, what's the point of the nationalism? Um, Chesterton has a very interesting observation on nationalism. Yeah, I forget which book he wrote this in. I, I want to say it was. Let me think here. I, I want to say that it was Heretics that he wrote this in, but he essentially said that. It was either orthodoxy or heretics. I don't know. I think it was maybe orthodoxy. But regardless, he said that a, a society that praises the military is a weak society because they are looking for a strong entity to make themselves feel better about themselves or to make their society look stronger than it really is. And the society that that does not have this reverence or this, this cult of the military is actually a stronger society. 
because they feel that, well, we don't really need all the uniforms and all the trappings of militarism to make ourselves look tough. And um, when I read that, that always stuck with me. You know, and I read that, uh, that was back, that was back in 2000, and late 2010 or something, I remember reading that. And that really struck me, and it's always, it's always stuck in my head, that, that line that I read from Chesterton. Even though I don't really remember which 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 of his books that I read that in, uh, but it always stuck with me because it just made perfect sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's like I think what he's saying actually is it's almost like the people think that they can't be strong on their own. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have to you have to have somebody else do it for you. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't I don't get that either. I mean, I hate saying this, but you know, you mentioned military and whatnot. I've clashed with uh, with several of them over opposing views, whether it be here on, on YouTube, Facebook, wherever, and one of the first arguments they make towards me is, well, I'm a military, uh, or I'm a military guy, I served, and I'm like, what, that's supposed to make me weak? Because, uh, because I, you know, you're, you're, you went and served in, you know, in war, you get what I'm saying. I'm so glad you brought this up, because uh, I can't tell you how common that is and and i respect our military don't get me wrong sure, to yeah. anybody anybody watching i am not bad mouthing our military i just think it's really crappy when they use their service just to get the upper hand in our in an argument i think that is piss poor when you bring up an argument with someone and they say something i remember i had a guy he was uh a former Navy SEAL, and he really was a former Navy SEAL. I know there's a lot of fakes out there, but this guy was a real Navy SEAL. And I said, uh, we, we started talking about the Church Fathers, because he was a part of some weird Judi Judaizing cult. And I brought up uh, the Church Fathers, and I brought up, um, who was it that I brought up? Uh, John Chrysostom. And I, I brought up John Chrysostom, and he said, well, John Chrysostom was an anti-Semite. And blah, 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 blah. And this guy was an anti-Trinitarian. He was. He, he hated the, the Holy Trinity, and he rejected the, the, uh, the doctrine of the, of the Trinity. And I remember he said, well, I serve my country, so I, I fought uh, terrorism and you haven't fought, done anything against terrorists. You're a coward. And you're the, and it was like a very, it's this very, it's this form of, of, of almost gang mentality. It's a, it's a form of gang mentality manipulation where I have done this. What have you done? Yeah, you know, he's. I got he, a gun and went into the desert and killed terrorists. What have you done? And it's like, well, I never brought up military service in this discussion. We're talking about theology here, but there is a—you're right. There is a lot of that that goes on, and I'm glad someone else has seen it because there's not—there's not a whole lot of people in this country who really see that. Well, and I—and I to be, tell you the truth, whenever I have had to confront somebody and that pulls that on me, I hate having to bring it up. I hate it because I know, like, when you're in the ser when you're in the service, you don't mm -hmm. you don't ask to go to war or to battle or to anything like that, but that's kind of what you signed up to do you know to expect it if it happens but it's it just don't use your service to make me weak i mean and also if you have to prove that you're tough and that you're brave to go into a war zone and you know kill somebody or whatever then that just that just tells me that you know something's not right up here exactly yeah and again, it's a form of manipulation because you're saying, "Well, I did this. What have you done? You haven't done anything." Yeah. So, so according to those people, the only way that you can do something is going to war. Well, there's like the only way you can be right. Yeah. Yeah. Same if thing. I went, if I, yeah, if I, if I had, a, if I have a gun or I had a gun and went into the battlefield, and that's the only way that I can be right. And that's just. Uh, it's manipulation. It's it's a but it works with a lot of people because a lot of most people are under this sort of uh, cult of personality or this cult of militarism um, because uh, for some reason in, in 
in the United States, uh, when you stick a uniform on somebody and have them talk in front of a camera, that brings legitimacy to whatever they're saying. And that's scary because, uh, you know, who's to say that someone isn't, some big politician isn't going to come and, and say, well, let's, let's do military rallies like they used to do, and uh, let's start uh, pumping up uh, uh, another war. Yeah. And people would revolt around, not revolt, people would um, revolve around that and uh, accept it. Yeah, it's, st- it's stirring the masses. Yeah, stirring the masses and things like that. And that's something that's scary. Well, and something that people need to realize, too, with, uh, you know, the military and in politics and the world of pretty much anything else, just because someone's in a respected service doesn't mean that they're uh, respectful and good people. I mean, there's some pretty uh, sadistic people in those things. Oh, yes. Just read about all the weird abuses that have gone on in the military in the past and also recently. I mean... um... I remember uh, reading about, you know, the the rape epidemic in the military. Yeah, the Pentagon. Um, I remember reading about how, you know, the, um, what was it, the Pentagon, you know, did a study and they said, well, we know for a fact that there were about 3,000 rapes in in 2016, there were 3,000 rapes, and this was not men on women, this was men on men. (laughs) And the American Psychiatric Association came out and said, actually, it's probably a lot worse. It's probably the tens of thousands. But they took back their statement. But even if they, even if the retraction was was valid, um, the fact still remains that thousands of people have been raped in the military. Men have been raped in the military. And so, yeah, there's a lot of screwed up people in the military. And people it's in the military would agree with me. And it's interesting that you brought up that particular story because you, you kind of already beat me to the punch, but... Yeah, go go figure. The Pentagon retracts that, and I'm willing to bet that that it was probably for damage control too. What do you mean damage control? Well, because you can't speak against the LGTB at all. Right, right, yeah. And there, and I remember uh, talking to a guy who was in the Marine Corps, uh, and he was telling me about how he left the Corps for that reason, uh, the inundation of homosexuality in the military. And uh, the rules that were being imposed on soldiers, um, restricting them and, and forcing them to acquiesce to the sodomite agenda, and it was just something he couldn't tolerate. And um, yeah, there's a lot of weirdness that goes on in the military, and people think that you know all these soldiers, you know, they wake up every morning and you know salute the flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance and recite the Declaration of Independence, but. The reality is, is that most of them got into the military for uh, lucrative reasons. Um, they had no nothing else to do, or you know, they wanted benefits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've heard some. Uh, I've heard I have some friends that are you know spread out across the military, and I've heard. I mean, I'd be lying if I said some very interesting stories. Uh, not much, but they can confirm what you're talking about here. I mean, they've heard they've heard through the grapevine that stuff like that does go on, and yeah. um, so so. But yeah, um, so so something else I wanted to uh, ask you. Speaking of military and overseas and all that, um, now I know that uh, uh your guys' website, uh, well, well, actually, it's shoebot.org now, right? Well, it's both. We had we got both domains, so oh, good. Back. I didn't. I didn't hear that part yet. No, so if I if I miss that one, I apologize. But um. Okay, and now speaking of that, I mean, obviously, you know, you guys had to go through the issue with the the hostile takeover and all that. Um, were you? What, since uh, I now know that you were able to recover the original domain name, um, do you guys? Uh, were you guys able to recover uh, rescue Christians from that as well? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Because I, I don't think that's something. Because that's something a lot of people don't realize either is that you and your dad actually have rescued people, literally, yeah. out of bad situations. Yeah. Yeah. Right now we are doing work in Mexico. Um, we we uh, financed the building of the building of a small pharmacy in uh, Michoacan, a small town in Michoacan. Um, the uh, the pharmacy. 
is designed by a was well, designed through a Catholic organization, um, but we financed the building of it, and then the, the organization is directed by a priest that we know personally. Oh, cool! Um, Father Jose Luis Barragan, and he um, has directed this, um, this charitable um, enterprise. Well, enterprise, you know, it's not a bad word, but we say enterprise it. Usually not, usually not something they put in with, with charity, but yeah, he directs this whole thing, this uh, charitable enterprise, and um, we built a, a pharmacy for poor people, people who are, are low in the socioeconomic um, hierarchy, and um, people who can't really afford pharmacy, or pharmaceutical uh, drugs and things like that, medicine. Um, Hold on, hold on, my, I'm getting distracted. My cat, my cat wants to come in. Hold on a second. That's no big deal. Do what you got to do. Hold on a second. Oh, my goodness. No kidding. Okay, so, yeah. But, um, we wanted to make a pharmacy for four people, and we did. And so, uh, right now, we actually just financed the formation of a trauma center for people who um, have suffered from cartel violence and so that's taking place right now and so we we will keep people updated on that once it is uh, completed but uh, yeah it's something that we uh, have been doing for years Um, we left Pakistan because Pakistan honestly was not a place where you could really track things and there were a number of people who would say that they're persecuted when they really weren't. And so there was a lot of that going on. And so we just said, you know what, this is impossible, like logistically impossible to verify. And it's logistically impossible to verify everything. Um, and so we just stopped working in Pakistan. And we started working in Mexico because the priest that we work with, we know. We know this guy, so it's just... There's a lot of there's there's a lot of um, it's a lot easier to to logistically direct that. Well, and you see that right there, Ted. That right there is brave to me, and that proves that you don't need to have a uniform or a suit on to be brave. Because you guys, and I'm going to get into this next, but um, you guys are going into an area where, as you pointed out many times. The, the cartel the, the drug cartels down there in Mexico they are reigning supreme um, the movie that you made hell across the border I didn't I didn't post a video but I did you know I did help promote it a little well, bit at the I, time I saw that yeah. and um, sure, that. that it was it was chilling but it's a reality and I'm telling all of you watching right now check that out hell across the border um, it's chilling but it's a reality so you guys going down to Mexico, and doing that, that I consider brave and admirable. Well, I haven't personally gone to Mexico, but we, the, the organization is there, and so um, we just simply financed it. But um, I would say that the people who, who get involved in this work have courage, absolutely. Okay. Um, the people who are, um, you know, the people who are involved in the building, I would say definitely. Uh, the people who are involved in directing the building of such a of such a, a place is I would say yes they have courage because you know hold on my cat oh my goodness hold on a second I'm sorry about this. it's all right cat I mean really oh good grief she wants to you know she wants to come in and to go out and, and the reason why she wants to go out is because you get the cat and then you she comes in and then you put her on the on the sofa, and because you put her on there, she doesn't want to come. She doesn't want to be on there. She has to get on there herself on her own. Yes. Decision. Oh, it's driving me crazy. Well, I but told yeah. you. I told you. I have eight of them, so I know how that goes. One of the one of them that we have is this big fat white oaf. He, you actually have to lift him up off his ass to put him in front of his food bowl. He will I not. Wish my cat was... <laughs> I wish my cat was this way because. Uh... My cat, she only does things on her own time. And if you do it for her, she doesn't want it anymore. So if I let her, if I 
the sofa because she has to jump on the sofa herself. You see how that works? Yeah. Yeah. So everything that she does, she has to do it on her own time. <laughs> Once you grab her and move her, she wants nothing to do with you. She wants to get out. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. Anyway, I hear you on that, dude. I, I don't... Back to what I... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. We can talk about yeah. cats all day, but this no, is more important. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. But yeah, I would say, you know, there was a case in Mexico of, of missionaries that were going around and they were trying to help people get off drugs. And these were uh, three Mexican university students, I believe. And they were involved in, the, in a Catholic uh, rehabilitation organization and they were actually uh, murdered by the narcos because of what they were doing against drugs against drug addiction helping helping to get people out of addiction so yeah i would say it is dangerous when you're messing with when you're messing with the cartels or when you're doing things in a cartel controlled area that they may deem as uh, impeding on their uh their industry well, yeah, I mean, if they don't have addicts, they don't have a business. Exactly, yeah, they don't want people getting off drugs, absolutely. Um, but yeah, where where was I going next with this? Um, so... I understand that, it, you know, when you interview people, I understand that um, it can be... I've, I've interviewed a number of people, I've interviewed a bunch of people over the years... And I can tell you that your brain starts like, oh, where was I? You know, so yeah. I totally understand. Thanks a lot, kitty. <laughs> yeah, it throws you <laughs> off. Your brain does that. Yeah, you know, it really sucks when it happens, I'll be honest with you. Mm. I, I've been there numerous times. I'm like, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, shoot. People think talking in front of a camera can be easy. I don't think it's easy. I've been doing it for 10 years. Good. And actually, Ted, you are my first interview here. And, I, and I'm sure I'm sure most people. I mean, I don't know if you've seen any of my channel, but I mean, look at the look at the stuff behind me. It's all sports stuff. I, I talk primarily Notre Dame football on this channel. So um, most yeah, people I probably do. I cover what? Cover sports? Yeah, yeah, that's what my channel cover primarily sports. is. I'm sorry. Say that again. Yeah. So what what is it about? that you like I've always wondered about this I've never been a fan of football I'm not saying I hate football or anything like that but like what is it about football that makes people get so energized behind it I have now I'm interviewing I'm sorry finish that I said now I'm interviewing you go ahead sorry hey this is you know what you can call this an interview all day long I think it's more like just two guys shooting the shit honestly yeah it's just a conversation yeah exactly yeah, I just want to I just, I just want to introduce you to my audience because, like I said, I, I think uh, more people need to need to know about you. There need to be more Ted Shoebots in the world. But uh, anyway, to answer your question, and I've a, I've been asked this multiple times, and I see I I played it all throughout growing up from age ten all the way through high school. Didn't play at the collegiate level because well, I didn't go to college, but. I think what it is is as when when you're one who plays the game, I think it's just it just it gives you a chance. Like myself, I was uh, an offensive defensive lineman, so you got to hit guys, and you got to do it legally. <laughs> I I know a very uh, a very boneheaded thing to say, but um, for me, it wasn't so much just you know getting to be physical but it got me a it gave me a chance to not only play a game but kind of grow more as a person you know show showing you that hey life's gonna knock you down and it's it's up to you to have the willpower to get back up and believe me when i played i was not a good i was not a good player i got knocked down quite a bit but i kept getting back up and i think it's helped made me a better person but as far as the fan aspect behind it uh, everybody has their reasons, but I, I think it's just because, uh, well, you, you know, you look at across, you look across America from all the small towns to the big ones, you know, especially the small ones, the people, the whole town gets behind the local high school football team. Um, 
I get. I think it's just because they they find that it's a it's a fun sport to watch. Um, they like seeing uh you know passes, runs, touchdowns. Uh, maybe chess just wasn't their forte. <laughs> I just always wonder, like, what's the big deal about it? Like a guy, like two teams are in the field, and then you have a ball, and then the goal is to bring the ball to the end of the field. And I don't see why people get so enthusiastic about it. Is it is it because of the physical um, challenge, the physical challenge of it? I would I would say that's definitely a part of it because you know you're seeing, um, well you're seeing uh, small guys trying to uh, run through three hundred plus pound guys, and you know it's just. It's kind of it's kind of like a sport that keeps you on the thrill of your seat kind of kind of ordeal. It's it's kind of hard to explain. It just I I've, I've always been I guess I've always been accustomed to it that I never really thought about it that much. Mm-hmm. But I I get it though. I mean, it's not everybody's cup of tea. You know, one could one could make the argument that it's just a bunch of testosterone uh, driven stuff. Mm-hmm. But I guess you know, like I, I grew up a big Chicago Bears fan. You know, I just I loved watching uh Walter Payton, even though he was near the end of his career when I was born. Um, but I just I was always uh, just fascinated with it. You know, even though it's a simple game that, like you said, um, you don't know why people get so worked up over it, but uh, for some for some reason they do. I can't really explain why. something I'll, just to change the subject yeah. change the subject here you know i did a video about andrew yang yesterday i saw it i haven't had the chance to watch it yet it's fine uh i did not expect the hate shit that i would get doing this video i should have expected it though because andrew yang is so popular now but i did not expect the hatred that, that, I, uh, that i'm getting now um i have gotten so far 58, 58 uh, th- thumbs down. I don't know what they call it. Dislikes, I guess. 58 dislikes. Yeah. 25 likes. I mean, my God. I don't think this has ever happened before. And uh, I'm sure I'll hear about it when I watch it, but I don't even know who Andrew Lang is. Or Yang, uh, or whatever. Guy who is running for president for the Democrat Party. Oh. He's a Taiwanese American, I believe. Um, He's, uh, you know, anytime I see someone growing in popularity, I, popularity, I always get very suspicious. So I'm like, why is this person popular? Who's pushing him? Who's funding him? Because I know that in the political slash activism industry, you cannot get popular without someone funding you. No, if you don't have the money, you can't have uh, you can't have success. That's just how it goes. Yeah, in the political slash activism world, I'm telling you right now, you cannot get famous without somebody backing you, without somebody wanting you to become famous. That is just the bottom line behind it. Um, you know, some people can get lucky and they make a video that goes viral, but that one video goes viral and that's it. You know, they whatever. They, they still have a, a YouTube channel that has like 315 subscribers or something. But when you talk about like serious fame, like internet fame, you cannot get that famous without people backing you up. You're connected to some organization, you're friends with some funder or funders who are backing you, who are bankrolling you. And this is how it works. Um, and, and I'm saying that just from from my own experience, you know, seeing how the activism industry works and seeing how people um, people really um, when they uh, when they get money from others, people are very very careful as to what they say. Oh yeah, they're very careful about what they say, and it's kind of like if you talk to someone who is afraid of getting a lawsuit. And they're being told by the lawyer what to say, what not to say, in order to protect their own asses. 
Um, it's like talking. It's like talking to someone like that. Well, I can't give you that information. I, I can only tell you this, but I can't tell you that. Blah blah blah. Because they are absolutely terrified of a lawsuit, and it's kind. Of, that's kind of like how it is talking to people who are controlled by funders. Um, they know that if they say just one thing that would anger the funder, they would lose their money. Yeah. I mean, if you, you you piss off the hand that, or you bite the hand that feeds you, it's going to bite you back in the worst way possible. Yeah. I mean, um, the only one that I can think of that actually won political office without raising a bunch of money, but this is tainted at the same time, too, because it was a celebrity, uh, Jesse Ventura, when he won governor of Minnesota. Now, he only raised, and for the record, Jesse Ventura... Cuckoo. Um, but he, he, of course, he won on his celebrity status. I mean, let's face it. People knew him from Running Man, The Predator, or being a professional wrestler. But at the same time, he only did raise like $300,000 $300, for his campaign. So there's always usually a catch to that. If it's not the money factor, it's your celebrity status. Kind of like Schwarzenegger. Or like Trump, you know, Trump has uh, has celebrity status. Yeah, I mean, everybody knew him as a a real a, bil a billionaire real estate way back in the late seventies. They know who he is. You talked about yeah, that on the video, the, the celebrity there factor. There, there are people out there who are a lot wealthier than Trump, but yeah, people talk about oh, oh uh, he's a businessman. That's why I was voting for him, and it's like no, you're voting for him because he's a celebrity. That's it. I mean, that's the, that's the main reason why people voted for him, because he was a he's a celebrity. They see him on The Apprentice, which is a, I think is a terrible show. I don't like that show, by the way. But they, they see him as a, they, they see him as this guy who was in The Apprentice, and um, they're like, well, I want to see that guy in the White House. You know, people have this fantasy about seeing it. They're always having this fantasy about seeing an actor in the White House. Like, oh, if I can get we can see this guy. This guy for president, and, you know, I think it's really silly. You know, I've heard people say, "Oh, Ted, you should run for president or whatever." It's like for one thing, that's completely impossible. You're uh, not even old enough, are you? Actually, I think uh, you. I think you're younger than me. I'm 33. Yeah, I'm not even old enough to run for president. But uh, you gotta be 35, I think. I'm 28 years old. Uh, but let's say I was old enough. It, it wouldn't make a difference because, for one thing, I don't have the funders. Uh, I don't have the you know people to finance my campaign. Uh, on top of that, in order to get the funding, I would have to sacrifice my own beliefs, and that's not going to happen. Uh, and then, on top of that, I would have to gain the favor of the masses, and that would be utterly impossible. No, because you got too many. You got too many people. I'm sorry. I should let you answer that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm like, I, I would have to go in there and be and, talk, and act as though uh, I really am concerned about you know the working inequality or something like that. You know, I would have to go in there and be like, well, you know, the American people aren't being heard, and that and I would just have to lie. Yeah, they're not being heard. Uh, I'm gonna be the guy that's gonna hear you and. It's complete nonsense, but you know, the scary thing about politics, and this is what I always say about politics, politics is like a drug. You know, I, I compare politics to a drug um, or some sort of an addiction because, you know, when you're talking to someone who's an addict, um, people who are addicts will say things like, well, just this one last time, you know, just this one last drink, just yeah. this one last drug, just this one last uh, gambling session. Uh, and I'll, you know, gamblers, you know, will say things like, oh, "I'll get the money, I'll get it, I just gotta keep on trying." It's an addiction, and so the reason why the addict says things like that isn't because he, it, it's really gonna be the last time he's gonna, you know, indulge in his addiction. It's because he wants to have an excuse to do it again. Yeah. And this thing goes with politics. In politics, people say, "Oh, well." You know, uh, Bush was is great. You know, Bush is awesome, and they voted in Bush twice. They hated Bush in his second term, and then after Bush was gone, it was like, well, we'll vote for a Democrat this time. Let's try him out. So then they voted for Obama, and they tried him out for two years, and they said, well, we dabbled in, in the Democrat Party for two two terms now. Let's 
let's try a Republican out. So then they voted Trump. Pretty soon they're going to get sick of Trump. And they're going to say, well, let's vote for this other guy. And then the other guy that will come in will be like, well, you know, Trump failed you, and, but, but I'm going to do the right thing, and I'm going to put America, Americans first, and I'm going to help fight against uh, socioeconomic inequality and help Americans uh, uh, pay for their loans or whatever, which is, you know, the idea of a politician helping people pay their debts. You know, that's been going on in this country since the independence of the United States. It's this dangerous revolving circle of what is the flavor of the month this time? Yeah, exactly. And so then they'll say, well, this guy will do it. He'll do it. And it's like, well, you voted for all these other guys before that, and they didn't satisfy you, and they didn't fulfill your fantasy of what a politician is supposed to be. So now you're going to vote for this other guy who's going to do the same damn thing. They just tell you what you want to hear. They're not going to actually do it. So, some of it they might, maybe. Some of but... it they do, but that make it look like, well, they tried, but they couldn't do it because it was the damn name opposing party. Yeah. That stopped them. Uh, I like that scene from Forrest Gump. You ever see that movie of Forrest oh, Gump? Oh, plenty of times. It? Yeah, there's a scene in that movie where um, the guy slaps Jenny in the face, like this hippie guy, and yep. Jenny is part of this weird anti-war group. Well, oh, she's a hippie, let's just say it. But she's but she, but she was just there because she was getting banged by everybody. But, right. Uh, she's with uh, this guy. This guy smacks Jenny across the face. So Forrest Gump beats the guy up. And then the next day, he's like, I would never hurt you, Jenny. Uh, it's, uh, it's, that, it's just that, that son of a bitch, Johnson. He's always lying. All yes. Time. You know, Jenny, you should come home yeah. with me to Greenbow, Alabama. I can quote that movie. Yeah. I loved it as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Still do to this day. Yeah. But, it's, oh, God, it's go the ahead. same mentality. Like, that guy, well, the president could have done the, It's like when you talk to people about the Iraq war. You know, when I saw the whole thing with ISIS, I, I thought, well, now Americans have finally learned the destructive consequences of this regime change policy stuff. And so... Some people did, but scarily enough, most people did not uh, learn from it. I don't think most people learned from it because uh, now that Trump has been talking about regime change in Venezuela, and now that you have people like Giuliani and, and Gingrich and Bolton, they're talking about you know they're lobbying for regime change in, uh, in Iran, Iran. Um, and, the, de the Democrats will say, well, this is wrong, and blah, blah, blah. But then the Republicans will come out and say, well, no, there's nothing wrong with this. And you say, well, haven't you, haven't you learned anything from what happened in, in Iraq? And they'll say, well, Bush did a good job in Iraq, but it was because of Obama's failing policies that Iraq went to hell. And it's like, what are you talking about? I mean, under the Bush administration, a million people died in Iraq. Anywhere between 800,000 to a million people died in Iraq. Uh, there was plenty of violence happening in Iraq when Bush was president. There were plenty of massacres that, that took place when Bush was president by insurgents against civilians and soldiers, uh, Iraqi soldiers. There was one massacre in which 50 Iraqi uh, 50 recruits into the new Iraqi army were butchered. None of those soldiers were armed. They were forced to be unarmed. Um, they were just people that were sent to the slaughter. Uh, the only difference between what happened in Iraq under Obama and what happened in Iraq under Bush was that the terrorists under Obama had a nice little film crew to make Hollywood videos of their, of their slaughtering. That's the only difference. That that type of filming wasn't happening, and that, that type of um, marketing for for gore porn wasn't happening uh, when Bush was president. You had you know these really you had these videos that were coming out that were done with the grainy film, and uh, people were using really low, you know low level or low quality camera work, mm -hmm. so nobody really cared. But you didn't have that when Bush was president. But then under Obama, 
you know, all of a sudden you had these videos coming out, and by looking at the videos, you know, they were sophisticatedly done. They had uh, multiple cameras being done at the same, being used at the same time. They had all, all sorts of editing that was done for them. Uh, you could just see it. You watch these videos, and you could see there's one camera angle where they're looking uh, above everyone, and it's like obviously they have a camera that has a, a jack that that can make the camera angle, you know, mm -hmm. face what's happening from uh, from a high point, and you're just like, well, who's filming this? What's happening? And then you, and then you find out that uh, there was a, a British uh, film firm that was doing videos for Al-Qaeda years ago. And uh, I believe the United States really made a contract with this filming firm to make these videos. And you know, they would have videos of Osama bin Laden and he's talking in front of a camera. And well, who was filming all this stuff? Yeah, uh, I mean... You know, who was filming all this stuff? And, and, and who made these sophisticated videos for ISIS? I, I can guarantee you that uh, it wasn't ISIS that was doing it. Because when terrorists do things, this is how they film. They get the phone. Oh, they, yeah. They don't know. They don't have all these fancy cameras and this and this uh, sophisticated uh, editing work. They don't have that. No. They don't have that. So how, who filmed all these videos for them? For all we know, it was some filming firm in Los Angeles that did it. So that wasn't happening when Bush was president. So everyone, so people look back and say, well, under Bush, it was fine. I mean, we, we weren't seeing all these crazy videos under Bush. It's like, no, the violence was happening under Bush. The persecution of Christians was happening under the Bush administration. And the Bush administration knew it and didn't care. Um, Here's the best way I can describe what you're talking about. Would you rather watch a brand new movie? Let's take a brand new movie, an action-packed thriller. The new Terminator's coming out this November. Would you rather watch that in black and white or in color and Blu-ray? Yeah. That's what it is. It just the cam the camera work got better, so yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing is that you know people like to use the the headlining that was done for the ISIS bombs under Obama to make it look like well this was all Obama's fault because under Bush you know it was better it was Obama's horrible policies that ruined Iraq and it's like no Iraq was screwed up in the early 2000s and um, you know when Bush was president most of the Christians in Iraq left that's what a lot of people don't talk about but most of the Christians living in Iraq not too long after the invasion of Iraq left Iraq they left it but why did they leave I thought under Bush it was great no because they were being killed by these insurgents. And, um, you know, people talk about Iran. And, oh, well, Obama helping Iran. Well, guess what? The same type of thing was happening when Bush was president because, you know, a, a lot of people don't remember um, this organization that was really big. It's still big, uh, but under Bush it was, it had a lot of uh, control uh, of, of uh, areas in Iraq, actually, it was called the uh, the Mahdi Army, and it's still there. It's still there in, in Iraq. It's an Iranian-backed Iranian insurgency group. And people talk about, oh, Iran's uh, influence taking place in, in Iraq, and you have all these Iranian-backed groups, and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that's true, but people don't talk about the fact that the United States protected the, the Mahdi Army. You know, it's ran by... Uh, Muqtada al Sadr, I think his name is. Maybe, maybe this is maybe fact. this is just me not paying attention, but I never heard of it in the first place. Huh, well, well, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I understand, but under under um, in the, during the American occupation, there was this group called the Mahdi Army that controlled a lot of territory in Iraq, and it was an Iranian-backed group. And um, when Bush was president, I remember hearing about how the U.S. was backing. And then, when Obama was president, all of a sudden people wanted to talk about, oh, Iran-backed groups in Iraq, blah, blah, blah. This is all Obama's fault. It's like, well, that, that kind of thing was already happening when Bush was president. And you know, people don't talk about that. But it's like, if you look at the presidency of Bush, if you look at the presidency of Obama, same thing was happening in Iraq, which was the horrendous violence. 
And the violence in the Middle East got war- worse when Obama was president, and I think that had to do a lot with us backing, well, not us, you know, but the United States backing uh, the destabilization of Syria and also the destabilization of Libya, and things got a lot worse with that. But that really wasn't because of the president. And this is the point that I'm trying to get across to people is the president can change. The party can change. You can get a new president. But policy does not change. That's the line that I've liked of yours is foreign policy. And you're right. When you look back on certain things, foreign policy never really changes no matter what party or what president is in office. Yeah, it it doesn't change. And so... Oh, and Obama got president. It got wor- worse. And, well, of course, it got worse because the U.S. was simply simply uh, continued the same policy it was doing under Bush. Of course, it's going to get worse. But the policy didn't change. And, and you know, back in the in the eighties, the, the United States government was already talking about destabilizing the Middle East. You know, overthrowing Saddam, overthrowing the Assad uh, dynasty, overthrowing Gaddafi, overthrow, overthrowing all these guys. And uh, we wanted the destabilization from the beginning. We wanted it to happen. Um, but people like to say, well, it's, it's, it's because of the president. No, it's not. I mean, Trump is a perfect evidence for this because Trump was, you know, one of the things that he was using, one of the things that he was saying to, to mark himself to, in his campaign was, you know, I was always against what was happening in Syria and blah, blah, blah. And people would, you know, show these tweets. Yeah, here he is saying, you know, don't bomb Syria or whatever. And, you know, he was talking about not arming the rebels and yada, yada, yada. But now Trump is saying, uh, Russia, you better not, you know, attack this rebel stronghold in Syria. Uh, you know, I remember Trump was even talking about collaborating with Assad to fight against the, the terrorists. Now he's saying, "Oh, Assad is a baby killer, and he's you know gassed his own." Uh, I remember that, which, which isn't true. Um, in 2017, you know, there was 50 Tomahawk missiles that hit Syria. W- what's happening here? I thought Trump was against all this. Well, what it proves is that it doesn't matter who the president is. No, and it's it's, it's it's and it's interesting that you bring that up because it makes me wonder, and I've always wondered this even when I was back when I was a teenager, how much power does the president really have whether whether he's you know good bad whatever regardless of what people think of him how much power does the president really have himself yeah. not a lot i mean he has some influence i think in domestic policy but as far as foreign policy though like, i don't think the president has any power well i mean what happened under carter i mean carter supposedly was against bringing the shah into the united states and there is a story that you can read in which President was, President Carter said you can't bring the Shah into the United States. And there was a group of people, um, they were basically like a part of the Team B crowd, you know, that, that whole neoconservative crowd that inspired for regime change in countries that, that, they, that they wanted to rob, essentially. Um, but I'm talking about the John J. McCloys, um, the Henry Kissinger types, those types of people. And um, they talked about, they were pushing for the president to sign an agreement to bring in the Shah. And Carter said, I don't want to bring the Shah to the United States. And then he said, what are you going to do? Carter said, what are you going to do when you bring the president, when you president when you bring the shah of iran into the united states and terrorists then take over the united states embassy what are you going to do the fact that carter said that really proved that in the in the inner workings or in the inner circles of the u.s government um, they already knew that by bringing in the shah into the united states you would trigger a riot in tehran and you would have a hostage situation in Tehran. And so they brought the Shah in anyway because they knew for a fact that it would it would trigger rioting in Iran. And that's exactly what they wanted. That's what they wanted. Uh, because they wanted they wanted an excuse to say, well, Iran has taken over the US embassy. We must freeze the, the bank accounts of the Iranian um, 
companies and we must freeze the, the bank accounts that are being ran by the Iranian government. And all of these bank accounts were in American banks. So the United States had an excuse in virtue of the fact that there was a hostage situation and in virtue of the fact that these accounts were in American banks so the United States could seize them. And so billions of dollars in, uh, in these billions of dollars in Iranian accounts in American banks were, they say, fro froze. They were froze, but the reality is that they were really robbed. And if, if somebody, if people want to argue and say, no, it wasn't a robbery, it was done because, you know, for our national security, you know, people actually want to argue that. Um, just look up uh, uh, John Shaheen. John Shaheen was a, um, he was a, an, an American Lebanese uh, diplomat of some sort, but he was also pushing for the Shah to come to the United States. And it ended up that, it ended up that um, tons and tons, millions of dollars in these frozen Iranian accounts ended up in the personal account of John Shaheen. So there was some robbery that was taking place. It just sounds like a big major scam. It was a big scam, yeah. But my point is that Carter, from what we know, warned against bringing the Shah into the United States, but yet he actually couldn't do anything to stop what these guys wanted to do. You know, it was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, because because I think with the with the presidential spot, the the pre, the position of president, it's the money and the lobbyists and the backers doing the ones that have all the power, not the president himself. Precisely. Yeah. And it's, you know, and speaking of, uh, of that, you know, during this conversation or this part of it, you brought up uh, Venezuela. That's one thing I did want to bring up is, and you did a, a video about her recently, but that, that Muslim, uh, Congresswoman, uh, how do you say her name? Omar, uh, yeah. yeah uh, Omar. Uh -huh. You got to give, you know, she's been getting a lot of uh, scrutiny for what she said, and you pointed this out in your video about what she said about um, APEC uh, giving money to, uh, uh, how'd she word it? Um, APEC giving money to politicians to make them. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yes, everybody's right. She is, she is a Muslim. She is worshiping um, a false idol. But in this, the video that you just did, you have to give her credit, like you pointed out. Uh, she said some things that were true, and you. And one of the things that you mentioned was, uh, uh, who was it that she called out about? Uh, I think it was the, a slaughter in Venezuela or Honduras. Oh, uh, Elliot Abrams. Abrams, yes. You you played the video of her calling him out, and again, what we said earlier, he won't reply to it. He won't answer the question. So I think I think that's very. So it's so it's interesting, um, as you said as you said in that video, uh, Omar got caught on a technicality because she she explained it the wrong way and that's what they got her on about you know APAC, but then you see a you see a video of her calling out Abrams, so she's saying you got to give her credit she is saying some things that are true, and there's Absolutely. video to prove it. You really can't deny what she said in that interview. I mean, that massacre in El Salvador really did happen. Uh, over, over 800 people were slaughtered by people that we were backing. For years, the United States, or people within the United States government were denying it. They were saying, oh, it was a communist uh, propaganda scheme. But now it's undeniable that stuff like that did indeed happen. There was a really horrendous massacre done in Central, I mean, some people call it a genocide, but there was a lot of killing that was done in Central America in the 80s by death squads that we were supporting. And it's uh, it's sad when people, they see you saying, well, it's true what this lady said, and because it's Ilhan Omar saying it, then they are uh, enraged at you. But let's say if uh, one of your heroes said it, let's say if uh, like one of these YouTube stars said it, 
you know, uh, Lauren Southern or Molly or whoever. I'd say it was one of those guys who went before Congress and, and told Elliot Abrams, you know, you did this and you did that. They'd all be cheering. Oh, look at Molyneux. You destroy this evil neocon. La, 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 la. But because it's Ilhan Omar who's saying it. And because she has that hijab on her head. All of a sudden, it's not legitimate. All of a sudden, it deserves our rage and our anger and our, our enmity. Yeah. Um, but it's like... You know, that's the that's the problem with most people. With most people, it's not what this person is saying. It's, well, who's telling me it? Yeah, and people have their mind made up because, because it's a Muslim woman that, oh, she obviously is lying. She's obviously not saying anything true. Oh, I heard people saying that it was an, what she did with Elliot Abrams is an anti-Semitic attack because Elliot Abrams is a Jew. The fact is that Elliot Abrams, if you look into his history, he, he is a huge part of the neocon circle, big in the regime change circle. That whole, like I call them, I call them the Team B circle. And the reason why I call them Team B, for those of you who don't know, Team B was a, it was a team of think tankers and lobbyists that were, um, they were put together by, I want to say George Bush Sr., and their job was to basically convince the U.S. government to do um, foreign, certain foreign policies, foreign policy issues that they wanted, Ma- mainly regime change type stuff. That's pretty much all they were doing. Uh, arming uh, the Taliban, uh, arming the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, um, backing Chechen uh, insurgencies. Uh, if you research all of these types of things, all, all of these ex- policies, you will find Team B behind it. That's why I would say the Team B crowd. And so if you look and and I'm not saying Elliot Abrams was part of Team B, but I'm just, I call it that crowd because the mentality is the same. It's the Team B type mentality. The Team B uh, it's that Team B mindset or that Team B way of scheming. And um Elliot Abrams is part of that same mentality. And so Elliot Abrams was the guy who was in charge of what was taking place in Central America when the U.S. was back in death squads to fight against the communists, supposedly. And those people did a lot of massacres, a lot of killing went on. And so Ilhan Omar was shedding light on a reality that not, not a lot of people talk about or think about. Um... And then also when she brought up the APAC thing, you know, people attacked her so much over that. And I feel that, or I don't feel, I see that she's actually shedding a light on a reality um, within the U.S. government and how the U.S. government functions as far as foreign policy goes. Um, it, it, and people were trying to get her on a technicality and say, well, APAC doesn't, fund anyone directly and that's true but the fact is that what APAC does is they fund people indirectly and by that I mean what they do is they give you a call they invite you to some meeting you go to the meeting and then they say um, well we've we've determined that you are pro-Israel so we are going to give you a list of donors with their numbers and you give them a call and you say APAC sent you and those donors end up funding the reason why a lot of politicians will fight over the approval of APAC is for that reason because APAC is going to APAC is not going to send you the money directly but APAC is going to send you to a source for money so probably like probably like Swiss the Swiss bank or something like that or some place that wouldn't ask a lot of questions I'm, I'm guessing no I'm not saying the Swiss bank I'm saying they will they will give you the contacts meaning they will oh, oh gotcha I misheard you I misheard you with the funders who will fund you I see that's I APAC see the APAC is well connected to all the funders and that's how that's how they are able to gain the 
most attention from politicians. I see. You yeah. Know, the reason why you see old politicians speaking at APAC conferences isn't because, oh, they really care about the Jewish people. It's about them getting the shekels from the funders who will listen to APAC when APAC connects them with a politician. I see. That's how it works. Yeah, I, I I misheard you badly on that. Forgive me. I'm going on like I'm going on three hours of sleep. <laughs> What's that? I said forgive. I said forgive me for mishearing you. I'm only going on three hours of sleep right now. <laughs> but um, but yeah, not changing subject here subjects here. But speaking of shekels, and you knew you knew I had to bring him up because you know you've sang the songs. Gonna go get my shekels tonight. Nice take on Eddie on Eddie Money, by the way. But Milo Yiannopoulos, your favorite person. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy, a uh, 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 disgusting, perverted heretic that you've been calling out for a long time. And actually, uh, would it be safe to say that I think he caught all of us by surprise? Because he kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, he did. He came out of nowhere. I, I, I... I did some reading on him and found out it was, his real name isn't Milo Yiannopoulos. I wish people would stop calling him that. Stage name. I, that I did name. know. His real last name is Hanrahan. That's what I have read. His real name is Hanrahan, uh, which supposedly is Irish. Ugh. But before he went by Yiannopoulos, originally he went by Hanrahan, and then he changed his name to Milo Andreas Wagner, which, which is... Yeah, he's not a Wagner. And then all of a sudden, he's Mr. Yanopoulos. So the guy is a uh, professional troll. He's a professional provocator. And that's all he is. Yeah, he's a professional provocator who is paid to rile up people. And um, I think he's also paid to get people to, to back up Sodom. Yeah. And... Yeah. When, when I first heard about him, it, it was actually through you talking about him. I did my own research. The only thing I knew about him was that he did writing for uh, for Bribeheart.com. And and then uh, then all of a sudden he's doing uh, college, uh, college campus talks, uh, appearing on different vlogs. And and you and you've covered this many times and I've even told people, off camera in my everyday life the same thing who are emphatic with this guy why are you so fascinated why do you support this guy you know the stuff that he's heard so what what's your opinion on, the, on that why do you think so many people are fascinated with this guy knowing that he knowing all the sick crap that he's said i'm asking the same question myself to be honest with you i don't know uh, I cannot fully comprehend and fathom why people follow this person. I don't. I can only observe the fact that people are following him. But I cannot fully explain why. Uh, I have something of an idea, though. And again, this is just from my own suspicion, from my own anecdotal evidence because it's from my own experience, from things that I've seen and how people act. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to explain it. Um, so in the United States, and as, as it is everywhere else in the world, uh, people are controlled by labels and cliches. And so in the United States, there is the left-right dichotomy. There's the left and then there's the right. And if you're a right-winger, you are expected to act in a certain way. If you're a left-winger, you are expected to act in a certain way. So if you're a right-winger, you are automatically deemed as pro-life, you know, anti-abortion, um, pro-traditional uh, values, Christian values, you're against gay marriage, and you love Bush and believe the war in Iraq is great or whatever. If you are a left-winger, you are expected to be pro-choice, pro-abortion, infanticide, pro-homosexuality, pro-Marxism. And that's the um, 
conventional perception of these two labels. Now, I would say that for the most part, those labels are true, right? That's changing, mm -hmm. but for the most part, those labels are accurate for most of the people who are who uh, put themselves under these categories. So if someone says, I'm with the right, yeah, most likely they're going to be against gay marriage and all that stuff. If someone says, I'm with the left, yeah, they're going to be pro-abortion and homosexuality. Okay, fine. So the thing is that we have not um, we have not summed up the whole struggle as good and evil, right? We haven't we don't look at things as evil versus good. We tend to look at things as left versus right. And even the people who say, oh, I believe in good versus evil, if you talk to them, they fall into that persuasion of left versus right. Because they'll say, well, the left is evil, and the right, they're trying to do the right thing. That's why they call themselves right, right? Yeah, no, I, I get you. <laughs> um... So because we we see this, because we view everything through this dichotomy, we are open to manipulation. Because once we see things as a dichotomy, and we break that dichotomy as one side versus the other, and we have we have um, defined uh, both sides as being uh, confined. Into, into, two, into two different belief systems and, and we just confine them to that, we limit them to that. Then what can happen is someone can come into your side and say, well, I agree with everything that you say, but I believe in this, in this thing that you won't like. So Milo comes along and says, well, I am a you know Catholic, sodomite who loves Trump well, what, what does that do it then stirs up it it, it, it it rattles people's cages because then they say well the left has always been you know pro gay but they've always been part of the democrat party or whatever but here's a guy who's a sodomite who isn't um anti-Trump, he loves Trump, he's lobbying for Trump, so then they had this mentality of, well we, well, Milo is really good because he's going to confuse the left he's going to make the left look, uh, he, he's going to confuse the left because the left wouldn't know what to do with him because he's gay Yeah. You know? and I've heard this many many times this is actually the main explanation I hear from people as to why they love Milo it's because, well how many times do you ever see a, a sodomite who loves a Republican president, right? You don't, you don't see that because the left is pro-gay, anti-Israel, mm -hmm. anti-Republican, blah, 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 blah. But this guy is gay, but he is pro-Trump and pro-Israel and all that stuff. And so we can use him as a way to get back at the left. He's trolling the left. You see how great this is because the left doesn't know what to do with him because he's a gay guy who uh, is a, a Republican. And then they'll say, well... Now the Republicans can win the gays over because uh, Milo proves that the left doesn't really care about gay people. The left, the left just wants gay people on their side so they can use them for a political stunt, and uh, and they actually mistreat you know good gay folks like Milo and blah 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 blah. And so it's a way to um, it's a way to confuse. Uh, yeah, this is what this is the way they see it. It's a way to confuse other people. You know, it's a way to it's a way to get the left. Um, well, let me just rephrase because my my mind is kind of scattered. Would it right? kind of be like saying, "Yeah, hey, look, look, uh, pro LGTB left. We got one of yours on our side. So yeah, so exactly, stick it." Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, but, the, but the, here's the thing. This is this is why it's so dangerous to limit everything by by left versus right mm -hmm. because if everything is well the left is this that and the other and the right is this that and the other then some guy can come over and say well no i agree with you on everything here but i am this other thing over here i you know this this person come over and say well i agree with you i love trump and i love israel and all that but i'm a sodomite 
blah blah blah, blah. They can just, you know, people can say that and and then they'll say well hold, hold, hold on a second now so it looks like it looks like the left it's it, it looks like the sodomite circle is not just in the left you know there's good sodomites out there yada 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 but we can bring him on to the right because he's a right winger it's okay see that's the danger it's that right is very good, troubling yeah like right good left bad so then if someone is a, a right-wing sodomite, he's okay because he's a right-wing sodomite. He's one of our guys. You see, and that's the issue that I have with the whole left-right thing. Yes, you have to look at, what, regardless of what you identify as, and in this case, you know, the right-wing, you have to identify the evils that are on your own side. Because there are so many wolves in sheep's clothing. And yet so, yeah, ma- so many people, it is, it is unbelievable. Even some in my own family, it drives me crazy. They are so fooled by the LGTB lobby, by feminists, uh, pro-abortionists, all that stuff. It, it, it is just unfathomable. So, so I'm like, what are you doing? Right. And so that's the thing. Uh, they, they, a lot of people think, well, he is a sodomite, but he's pro-Trump, so... He's trolling the left, ha ha ha! That's so great. Yeah, and it's and it's and, and it's disturbing that and and you know uh, you've pointed this out many times in videos. I've said it to people. I've talked about Milo briefly on here on my channel before, and I'm sure most people watching probably know who he is because he has gotten pretty mainstream, obviously. But I just fail to see how you he said in videos. And in articles many times that he he has no problem with with pederastry pedophilia he supports eugenics by saying ba- basically he's a homosexual supremacist yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. and how how these people like for example Michael Voris and uh, what's her name Christine Niles at church militant yeah. Yeah, yeah. how they can feature this guy or, 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 any, or any homosexual in any positive light on their website. Because I think if you are a true Christian, and if, if you're going to uh, promote or feature a, a homosexual on your website, YouTube channel, whatever, then it better be to expose them for the evil that they that they truly are. But of course you got Church Militant, Michael Voris and all them not doing that. They're actually embracing him. Um, I remember when, you, uh, when that happened the first time on Church Militant, uh, when they covered uh, uh, his Milo's interview with America Magazine, you did that video where you confronted Voris. Right. And I, I knew of Church Militant, but uh, I wasn't really a follower, so I go check it out. And I'm telling you, man, and I'm sure you saw the comment section too, watching all those people comment in favor of Milo, saying, oh, I love, this, this is no joke. I saw one person say, or one one woman say, uh, "Go figure, a woman loving a homosexual." Surprise, surprise. Um, she says, "Oh my, oh my God, I love Milo. I- I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a rosary for him right now." Well, someone right, yeah. somebody right behind her types out the rosary, and I'm like, "Good Lord, I am, I'm literally reading the Jonestown cult right now." That's that's how I saw it. These people are out of their minds. They think they don't, it's almost like in the Bible when when people when Jesus when Jesus is walking by the crowd and people are trying to touch his robe, that's how these people were treating Milo. That's how they were talking towards him. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? They, because they think they really believe that by getting Milo, they can they can uh, damage the left. And Milo is like the hope for us against the left. I remember hearing um, years ago a David Horowitz from the Horowitz Freedom Center. He uh, did his. He, this was this was not too long after uh, the fact that Milo was lobbying for pedophilia was headlined, and um, Milo was invited to speak at the Horowitz Freedom Center, and Horowitz said that. Milo is one of the greatest voices ever against the left. He's one of the top voices against the left and all this nonsense. Um, I think there's another reason why the people like him are so popular. And that is for us, it's really a, a metaphysical reason. Um, 
it's because as society continues to be entrenched by the spirit of Antichrist, it continues to migrate into the, the Republic of Sodom. And in the Bible, there's a verse in, um, in the book of Revelation. It says, Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. You know, that, that city, that, this, this, that city, Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified, spiritually is Sodom and Egypt. And what does that mean, Sodom and Egypt? Homosexuality and paganism. Sodom represents homosexuality. Egypt represents paganism. And the re reason why I say Egypt represents paganism is because in um, the New Testament and also in the Old Testament, it describes Egypt, it describes going to paganism as going to Egypt. So, for example, I think in Isaiah, it talks about the golden calf and how the, 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 the Hebrews went for the golden calf, and it says that you, you returned to Egypt. And then St. Stephen, in the book of Acts, when he's, he t he's t confronting the Jews, and he's saying that when the Hebrews went to, um, to the golden calf, and they started worshiping the golden calf, their hearts had returned to Egypt. So there's this concept, there is Egypt as a geographic place, but then at the same time, there is this concept of Egypt that the Bible talks about. And this concept of Egypt entails paganism. And so when the Bible says Sodom and Egypt, it's speaking of homosexuality and Egypt. Sorry, homosexuality and paganism. And um, it says, you know, Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified, Sodom and Egypt. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another verse, I believe it's in Zechariah, where it says, God is telling the Israelites, you know, you have returned to Sodom. You have gone to Sodom. And it describes Jerusalem as Sodom. So the church, you know, is the new, is, is, it's the continuation of Israel. And Rome, or the church, is the continuation of, of, of Jerusalem. You know, Rome is the new Jerusalem. And what's happening with the new Jerusalem? What's happening with the continuation of Israel? Well, same thing that happened in ancient Israel. People are going to Sodom and people are going to Egypt. So, you know, when Jesus was in the world, he was confronting a priesthood that had become utterly corrupt. And he was confronting a people that had, for the most part, separated themselves from the religiosity that, that God wanted the Hebrews to have. And so, uh, what's the world going to look like when Jesus returns? Well, it's going to be like the world that he confronted when he came here. You're going to have a very corrupt priesthood. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a people separated, or people a people that have severed themselves from the uh, from the faith, even though they think even, even though they think that they're a part of the faith, many of them have actually severed themselves from it without even knowing it. So oh, yeah. the world that Jesus is going to confront in the future is going to be parallel to the world that he confronted in the past. So when the Bible speaks of Sodom and Egypt, and when the, when the Old Testament describes Israel going to Sodom, and a people whose hearts are returning to Egypt because they're going back to paganism, that's the world that we are entering. We are entering Sodom and Egypt. So how are the, how are the people who have for years claimed to be on the side of traditional values going to side with Sodom? How are you going to get those people into Sodom? How are you going to make those people become citizens of Sodom? Well, you have to come up with some sort of a scheme you know, oh, he's a Republican sodomite. You're going, to, you're going to have to come up with a scheme in which someone is introduced to, to them as a conservative sodomite or as a sodomite who uh, is simply trying to find God and he's struggling with himself and blah, blah, blah. You're going to have to get, get some, someone like that who can appeal to people who, um, 
at the surface don't want to accept or claim they don't want, don't want to accept sodomy, but will eventually. No pun intended. No pun intended. They you want to get in bed with them, schmooze them, and use them to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and so, um, you, know, you 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 look at people and how they become such zombies. You know, it's quite scary how people can flip so easily. You know, oh, I'm pro-traditional marriage, blah, blah, blah. But then you see someone like Boris, and he's like, oh, Milo is great. I agree with everything he says. He's awesome. And it's like, this guy literally lobbied for for the, for the acceptance of older men sodomizing young boys. And you're okay with that. Yeah. You don't have, you, you don't have a problem with it. It doesn't bother you. Exactly. And I, and I remember uh, when you first uh, brought attention to Milo, one of the videos that you showed was, uh, and I, I like how you how, how you refer to this guy, David Rubin, the sodomite Jew. Yes, <laughs> I, I like. Know. Yeah, what yes. the interview that Milo did with him, I'm sure I, I'm sure he's had many with him, but this one stuck with me because when when Milo's going on talking about in this particular interview about how he's how homosexuals inherit genet genetic. Uh, or superior genetic makeups from how they were born and all that stuff. The one disturbing phrase, well, it was all disturbing, but the one disturbing phrase that stuck out to me the most was at the end of the clip when uh, when David Rubin says to him, yeah, I mean, you, you want equality for everybody, and, My and Milo says, and this says a lot about him, when he said, oh, why would we want uh, equality? We're already superior. That's right. Even if he was, even if he was legitimately joking... That's still pretty damn it, disturbing. I'm sorry. I'm so sick and tired of hearing this trope of, oh, it was just a joke. Yeah. Uh, well, I say that loose. I, I don't say that for real. Right. It's a strategy to get people to... It's a strategy to disarm people when they say, well, hold on. You said this. Oh, it was just a joke. Oh, it was just a joke. And it's a way to... to it's a way to make the opposition look stupid. Oh, you see, he's taking jokes seriously. Yeah, and if, if if you were joking, if you were joking, then you wouldn't say it multiple times. I mean, one time's disturbing enough, but multiple times, and you expect it's not a joke. you and you yeah, you expect all of us to think that you're joking. No, you're not joking. You're they telling. Always the, play this game. They always play this game, and people like him have been playing this game since. Well, probably for thousands of years, but I, I know for a fact that they were playing the same type of game before the French Revolution. You know, they, they would, you know, Baudelaire talks about how Voltaire will will use mockery and humor as a way to convey his message, and that's this is the same strategy, you know, using mockery and humor to convey a message, so that when the opposition says, "Hey, look at what this person is saying," you can say, "Oh, it was just a joke. Why are you taking it seriously?" You're too sensitive, blah blah blah. So it's a way, it's a strategy of, of disarming the opposition, and it's also a strategy of, of generating consent towards a certain behavior. Because yeah, it's a joke one day, but guess what? Pretty soon it gets accepted, and then when someone opposes the acceptance of it, they will say, "Well, you know, you need to get with the times, and who really cares, and get a life, and yada yada yada." And um, that's what Milo is doing. He is desensitizing people. You see, that's another and, thing. That's another thing too. I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you, Ted, but I. I hear that all the time. These people who support homosexuality and and abortion and all that stuff. They always say, "Oh, come on, get with the times, man. Get with the times." When I think of get with the times, I think of stuff like getting a brand new flat screen TV while you're still watching an old school black and white TV. I think of medical advances. I think of better cars. Not saying that it's normal for a guy to stick his his piece up another man's backside. Mm -hmm. These excuses that the, that these people who support that crap come up with, it's just it's sickening. But I didn't mean to interrupt. I I digress. Go ahead, dude. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, uh, uh, that's what this whole Milo thing is about. It's about generating consent towards a certain. Behavior, and in this case, it's so, it's sodomite behavior, and you know, it's the ways of Sodom. Um, and so, 
when I saw Milo's interview on, on Boris, one thing that disturbed me was the fact that Boris never confronted Milo on his lobbying for pedophilia. Never. Never, you know, never, never challenged him on it. And in fact, in the end, said, "Oh, I agree with everything he says. He's great." You know, blah blah blah. blah. So, Voris, you you agree with that? That it's okay to sodomize an underage teenage boy? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, and, and that really revealed itself when he asked Milo, um, "You want to change the age of consent?" And Milo said, "I think 16 is a good number." And, and Boris said, "Yeah, I agree with you." <laughs> and you know what this? And they're, and they're, talking about, they're talking about this in the context of Milo's statements lobbying for pederasty. So what they really are doing truly is trying to generate consent towards a certain behavior. And speaking of and speaking of Voris, and ironically doing my own research on him, I found out he went to uh, the university I support, ironically. But uh, I, I have my own problems with Notre Dame, but I'll save that for another time. Um, but I just find it odd that Voris, he has no problem putting Milo on his show, featuring him in a, in a positive way, but yet, you make a video, and I've watched this several times because it's it, it's it's great watching you do this and confronting evil, but you confront this homosexual priest who is infiltrating a church down in Texas. Voris has such a huge problem with that, but he has, yeah. he has no problem putting on a guy who supports pedophilia says that homosexuals are superior to us who are normal. And on top of that, you know, just kind of in addition, Milo says during this interview, oh, I spoke too loosely when I said that stuff, when I said it. I spoke too loosely, meaning, oh, I revealed who I actually Yeah, am. yeah, exactly. Translation, I told the truth what, when I shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, Boris did not want to put the video up uh, because... Oh, supposedly I confronted a priest during in, in the middle of communion. I disrupted communion. Well, I, I didn't disrupt communion at all. I didn't really confront the priest because I never talked to him in the church. Um, I was confronted by his ushers. Um, and if you want to sit there and say, oh, if you did it during the mass, well, guess what? In the Passover, Jesus got a whip and hit people in the temple. Yeah. So I, it's a, a lot more dramatic than bringing a camera and um, and the reason why I brought a camera was so that I could show people because I, I didn't want to just play the video of me confronting the priest in the cafe um, and for those of you who don't know um, what happened this was back in 2014 there was a priest by the name of Monsignor Michael Yarbrough this guy uh, sexually assaulted a young man years ago um, and so I confronted him on it, and I got it on film. Um, but anyway, I uh, I confronted this priest and got it on film, but I didn't want to just put the film on YouTube because then people could say, well, how do we know this is even a real priest? So I actually wanted to show him giving communion and say, this guy is real. You know, it's not just me confronting an actor. It's not me confronting an actor at all. This is me confronting a real, a real priest. So when I brought the camera over and started filming, um, I'm guessing that Yarbrough told the ushers about me because they all knew why I was there, which was really weird. Cause I, I wasn't expecting that because I, I didn't expect that the priest would be like, yeah, there was this guy who confronted me and he looked this way and you see him because as soon as they saw me, they automatically knew who, who I was. It was really strange. Like, they actually had a photogenic memory of how I look like. You know, it's really weird. But I, I was holding that camera up, and they, they within minutes, they were there. And there were about four or five of them that surrounded me. Yeah, and, and in the video, didn't you didn't one of them say, when you told them about who Yarborough was, that one of the, didn't one of them say, like, I don't care anything about that, or I don't know anything about that, or something like that? Uh, one of them said something to the like... Uh, I, uh, uh, sorry, he said something to the likes of, I don't care about, about any of that. Again, very telling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is that Boris, you know, he calls himself a church militant. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, if this is going to sound sound kind of strange, but one of the things that actually inspired me to, to do that was 
when I first became a Catholic in 2013, when I decided to become a Catholic, I remember listening to Boris. And I used to like watching his show. You know, I didn't know that he was a plant or that he was conspiring for something evil. I thought that he was sincerely being what he was. And he said that if you're going to be a Catholic, you, know, you have to be willing to do what Jesus did and get a whip and confront the heretics. And um, when I decided to confront Yarbrough, you know, I had that in my mind. Like, if I'm going to be a true Catholic, I have to be able to pull the whip out and confront them inside of the church. And so I said, oh, here you, here you are. War is here. I do, I do what you told people to do. He didn't care. He didn't want to do it. So it's he's not a church militant. No. You know, that's what he calls himself because he wants to have this perception that he is this guy who's the only one, you know, he's the only Catholic media source that's fighting for the faith, unlike EWTN. But that's really just a way to squash the, the um, what do you call it, the uh, competition. And it's a way to market himself. It makes him look distinct. And so it's also a way to get the conservative Catholics on his side. And when you have so many people on your side, then you can sort of change your position to try to convince your constituents to change their beliefs on certain things. So, you know, for years, Boris has been, you know, confronting the evils of it within the church, the corruptions within the church. Well, and this is something, yeah. this is something that, yeah, uh, you actually just kind of beat me to the punch here. This is something that I've wondered since all this has unfolded with, with uh, you and Voris and Church Militant. You know, you read, you read his bio. He is. He says he's a former sodomite. Used to be a, a mem, uh, Used to be used to be a member of the Republic of Sodom. Now I'm not trying to stir crap up or spread rumors, but this is something I've wondered about. If it came out and was revealed that Voris actually went back to his Republic of Sodom ways, would that would that surprise you in the slightest? No. Which is why you know he's doing all this by bringing Milo on and kind of laxing it up a little bit I think that he is if you want to get my serious opinion I think Shoot. that Boris is a plant I think he's a plant that has been commissioned to get the conservative Catholics to become pro sodomite that's my opinion on him well it's definitely working because uh uh, and not jumping, not jumping around here, but you and I both have exper have recent experience with this. But uh, Dean Esme, red pill religion, yeah, yeah. red pill religion dude, and I'm not, and I, and you know, I'm not doing this to be like, hey, look at me, everyone. Uh, Ted Chubot brought up my comment in one of his videos, but when I heard that guy come out and you know say what he had to say. Uh, you know, you mentioned him on the people that were commenting when you showed the comment section. I looked him up. I'm not going to pretend to know everything about him. I just really know that he's, a, you know, a former atheist converted to, to Catholicism, claims he found God and all that. But yet, just like all the other zombies out there, he, um, you know, pretty much worshipping the ground Milo walks on and has no problem with uh, Voris and his uh, non-combative uh, approach with Milo. And when I when I left that comment on his page on his the night that he did a video, uh, go, you know, going against you, uh, questioning you know why you were saying what you were saying, and it had to have been my comment because there were only two other people, and one was a guy who was agreeing with him, and the other was an occultist. <laughs> so talk, start your three guys walking to a bar joke there, an occultist, an agreeer, and me. <laughs> but uh, anyway. I seriously asked him that question not to annoy him. I really wanted to know because so many people are like that. They claim to be this person of faith who is for the scriptures, believes in the scriptures, but yet they, they go against it. And I really wanted to know why he was, you know, supporting this guy. And of course, uh, you know, you guys had your, your thing, uh, your debate on, on YouTube him and I was just back and forth on the comment section for like three or four days. And uh, this guy, I don't think he's stupid. I actually, I do think he's a smart guy, but I think he is very, I think he is very misguided and completely misunderstands the scriptures. 
because he was using I, he was using them Dean to justify. Esme. I think that Dean Esme is very. Um, I think he's very dishonest, to put it bluntly. Because and if he's listening, I hope you are listening, because this is my my uh, response to you. Yeah, and Dean, if you are watching. Esme. If you are watching, I honestly was not trying to annoy you. I really wanted to know. But go ahead, Dad. I think that this, I think that Esme is very dishonest because when I was debating with him, he would act well. He would act as though he was agreeing with me, or that he was changing his opinion, or that he was open to my opinion. He would say, "Oh, you're right about this, and you're right about that." And yet, there wasn't a lot of resistance from Esme. And as I was talking to them, I got the impression that he was being dishonest because I thought, well, he had all these opinions, but now he's acting like he doesn't want to argue with me. He doesn't want to challenge anything I'm saying. What's going on here? And then he, I was reading his comments that he was typing up on, on YouTube, and they were just completely different. I mean, the, the disposition of his comments were completely different from, from the way that our conversation went. Because in the comments, he was disagreeing with me. He was saying, well, I disagree with him on this, and you shouldn't say this, and blah, blah, blah. He was a lot more aggressive in the comments section. So I said, I remember asking myself, well, why wasn't he this way when we were talking uh, in the chat? Why, why, why wasn't he this way when we were talking in, in the so-called debate, in, in, the, in, the, in the discussion that we had? So he's not an honest person. You know, and, I, and I really uh, lost respect for him when I saw that. Based on how much I know of him, which which isn't much, and but in my interaction with him, he he's one who likes to play the, the play the field, wherever he can get favoritism, and he, he and if he thinks that people won't follow up on him, he'll play the game, but say something completely different behind the scenes and somewhere else. I think, if that makes any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, people like him, I really don't like because. Uh... Something so obvious as what Milo said, lobbying, peder, lobbying or, and promoting pederastry. I mean, something so obvious as that, people say, well, I'm not sure if I really see it. I'm not, I think Milo is just a broken soul and yada, yada, yada. And it's like people like that, I just have no respect for well, them and, because they can't identify the obvious. They can't admit to the obvious. Well, and when he, when he said that uh, he didn't like uh, that I called Milo a sodomite, well, like... Like you said, that's what they're called in the Bible. Okay, the word homosexuality didn't exist back then, so that's what they called them. But wh people, where do people think the word sodomy originates from? Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just amazing. A basic Google search will tell you all this. But, yes. but uh, one thing, too, that he talked about uh, in the in the debate that you guys had. The part about where Milo said in this interview with, with Voris, um, oh, it's just something we joke about, and Esme even repeated it to you. Yeah, and pedophile rings and whatnot, they joke about that. Abuse victims joke about, uh, pe make yeah. pedoph uh, pedophilia jokes. There's nothing right. There's nothing right about that. There's nothing funny about that. Okay, look, here's the thing. If, if Milo was indeed sexually assaulted when he was a 13 year old boy then yes i have sympathy for him on that no child sh should ever ever have to go through that but here's the thing milo is not a 13 year old boy anymore he is a grown-ass man and here he is promoting the same horrible things that were done to him as a child and Esme, he thinks it's normal to joke about that stuff? No, and I told him that. It's and Milo, joke. too. It's not funny. No, no, it's not funny. Go go to, I would, I would tell Dean Esme this. Go to a woman who has just survived a traumatic rape. Go joke with her about being raped and see if it's funny. Oh, you got raped. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Yeah, no, oh no, a grown man sodomizes a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, haha, ha, that's funny. And and then on top of that, he says, well, Milo was drunk, people. Get off him. Come on. Look. Well, when you're drunk, you kind of say what you really believe, right? Yeah, I'm drinking I'm drinking a little bit of whiskey right now, a little bit of whiskey and Coke. Guess I what? Yeah, and I'm, I, of course, I've, I've had too much to drink in my life. I don't deny that. 
I've been drunk before, but guess what? I don't joke about pedophilia. Let me tell you something. When I get drunk, or all the times that I have been drunk, I talk about sports. I sing, or I dance, or in my particular case, on one occasion, I, I uh, uh, by accident, insult another man's wife. I'm not talking about wanting to legalize uh, uh, grown men sodomizing teen young teenage boys. I mean, really, who who says who says that? Who who jokes about that? Who thinks that that is normal? It's not. Yeah, it's sick. But um, well, sick is an, is an understatement. But yeah, it's diabolical. Fine. Yeah, and uh, I really just lost respect for that guy. I really don't like him. So I hope he's listening to this right now. I really don't like him. Oh, but yeah, I just. Uh, I mean, in general, not ju not just Milo, but homosexuality in general. I mean, why why people can't see how this is how this is just disgusting and evil is beyond me. And I, I don't. I honestly, I've said this many times. I don't care if I lose viewers from this. If I lose uh, subscribers, I've already I've already lost friendships and member and you know family relationships because of me speaking out against it. Because it is disgusting, and yeah. and an, an example of kind of what how this all relates with Milo and you know the Dean Esme and all that. I found out about a year, year and a half ago, give or take, that uh, we have a, a member of my family who's a sodomite. Because so I was over, I was over at my brother's house one night, and um, we were I forget what something was on the TV. It might have been it might have actually been during the debates or something. I don't know. But uh, I was just telling my brother the same thing I'm telling you and everybody else watching. You know, this is sick, it's evil, it's diabolical. And he says to me, well, well, Sean, we have a family member who's gay. And I'm like, well, who's that? Who's that? Not that it makes a difference, but who's that? I say to my brother. He goes, or, and I'm not going to name names, but uh, our cousin is. And, I, and my, my response is this. So? So because so because so because we have a member in our family that's a homosexual, I have to support him. No, I'm not going to. I mean, what what if he was what if he was in a in a polygamous relationship, a polyamorous relationship? Uh, what if him and one of our other families family members were in an incest sexual relationship? Am I supposed to call that okay? And and that's the argument that I made to many people. You know, the people who back homosexuality, they never back other sick plural unions now they are though you're seeing it more and more oh yeah T TLC that channel has not one but two shows promoting polygamy you uh yeah and it, yeah, I remember had a show called uh Big Love or something like that it was about Mormon polygamy uh, I never saw that one the ones that I'm talking about are uh uh sister wives and then uh seeking sister wives I've never watched them but I know what they are but it's just yeah. give it give it time give it time you'll see incest on the way milo's already getting it started with uh with pederastry um i saw one show and and do, do you know do you know what polyamory is yeah you got like a uh, guy and girl and they can do whatever they want kind of thing yeah it's basically an orgy getting married and saying that they're married to each other but there, there was a show. I think it, I can't remember what channel it was on. HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, one of the two. Uh, yours, mine, and hers. So now they're now they're promoting uh, polyamory. So it's like, what is next? Yeah. But yet, exactly. but yet the people who support the Republic of Sodom don't re uh, support that stuff, which I find absolutely ironic. So so that stuff that stuff is wrong to them. But mm -hmm. a guy sodomizing another guy is a okay. It's they have no problem with that. That's not disgusting. Yeah, when people say, "Oh, my cousin is a sodomite" or whatever, it's like, "Well, you know, your cousin could be like a murderer." I mean, who cares? Like, what does that mean? Well, and this cousin in particular that I'm talking about, I don't really know him that well because he's one of those cousins where there's a big age gap. Yeah, so basically, he he's getting his life started where uh, uh, when you're just being born. So I don't really know that much about him. I just know he's into, you know. IT stuff and all that, but never talk to him, and I certainly don't plan to. But it's just, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, in the world, you know, there is a 
there is this the pro sodomite crowd and and then at the same time you know that whole milo mentality of like well he's a right-wing sodomite and it's okay but then you know in that same world there's this whole network of evil and it's it's like the, the gay jewish conservative whatever that means and he backs brexit or whatever and it's like you see stuff like that and it's just like what is going on there's no there's no such I thing as a there's no such thing as a gay christian i mean no, there isn't. i see i see this all the time on my facebook wall you know people who i'm finding out are actually for that group for that stuff and i'm like there's no such thing as a gay christian i mean i remember one person tried to post a um something from their church i forget i forget which what denomination it was but they're saying nobody how anybody who uses their church to uh, be a bigot is uh not a christian and i'm like and I, i'm like well a church that promotes sodom and gomorrah is not a christian exactly and um you look at this whole milo thing and you look at that whole but that whole circle that whole crowd of people and you're seeing the promotion of Sodom, and then you're seeing also the promotion of nationalism at the same time. And that's something that always gets me when I see the promotion of nationalism and the promotion of homosexuality. And when I see that sort of thing, it always reminds me of the, the, the SA, you know, the group of people that brought Hitler into power. Yep, uh, I'd use that example. Yeah, German nationalist sodomites. So when I see Sodom and nationalism, I'm just like, okay, here, where's the next ride? Here we go. You know, yeah. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. And then you see this Andrew Yang guy, and he's promoting promoting a form of socialism. And at the same time, Andrew Yang is pro Sodom, pro infanticide. You're just like, okay, well. All that's next for this equation is nationalism. But then you'll have national socialism. <laughs> and I'm not saying Andrew Yang is a national socialist. What I'm saying is that the fact that he's garnered so much popularity is a reflection of what's happening in society, and that is the rise of socialism. But at the same time, you're also seeing a rise of nationalism. And so politicians, I mean, politicians have no uh, ethics for the most part. I mean, they have no boundaries as to what they will support. So if they see a rise in nationalism, then they can start backing nationalism up. And then if they see a rise in socialism, they can back socialism up. So if you see a rise in both, nationalism and socialism, then hey, why not support national socialism? Yeah, and, and people don't and people don't seem to re realize how dangerous nationalism is. Cause, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but nationalism is more for what's better for the country, and then patriotism is like actually fighting against something for the good of the cause right like for what's actually well, yeah, actually good so yeah patri there's patriotism and then there's nationalism so nationalism is when it's my country first before anyone to help the whole it doesn't matter if they suffer or whatever who cares uh, nationalism also entails my country is great no matter how much evil it does um it's this uh, indiscriminate reverence for the nation and the people, and the, especially for the politicians. Um, patriotism is, I care about this country so much that I will point to its evils and, conf and confront its evils and tell other people about its evils because I, I want the country to reform itself. And patriotism also entails doing things good for your society and for your country as well. So patriotism has a balanced view, and that's one thing that I appreciate about it. Um, I don't like nationalism. So that's my view on that whole thing. Um, you, you know, when I start seeing people saying things like, you know, Sweden for the Swedes and you know, Germans, you know, Germany for the Germans and all that stuff, and how that type of trope is becoming more and more popular and so much more common, it's a sign of some bad things that are going to happen. Very bad things, I think. I think Europe is going to tear, apart, tear itself apart in war. Uh, you're seeing uh, presaging events to that, especially in Ukraine. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but in, you know, Ukraine is having its election this month. 
and um, the, the Ukrainian government has commissioned a Nazi party to oversee the elections to make sure that there's no corruption taking place. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's really crazy. Uh, it's called the National... What's it called? The National Militia, I think it calls itself. Um, but... Um, um, the fact that you see so much Nazism in Ukraine, and the fact that <clears throat> you see in the, within the Ukrainian government so much Nazism taking place, and how it, it's rooted right within the state itself, within the government itself, and how much of a long history that it has, it, it's a presaging, it's a, it's a presaging of something very bad. And if you look at the the trend of history, one thing that you will notice in Europe. When you have a, a conflict that tears the continent apart, things usually, well, things tend to begin in the East for some reason. Uh, so before the Thirty Years' War, you had a revolution in Bohemia, which is today's Czech Republic and Slovakia. And then that eventually escalated into a full-out war that devastated the whole of Europe, going all the way from, you know, all the way up north, as, all the way as far north as Scandinavia, all the way down to, to Poland, <clears throat> all the way down to Spain. I mean, it was, a, it was a horrific war that lasted for a very long time. You know, they called it the Thirty Years' War, but even after the war ended, France and Spain continued the fighting for another 50 years or so. So it was like more like the 80-year war. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you have World War One, and that begins a conflict between Austria and Serbia. And then it escalates into a full-out war that devastates Europe. Tens of millions of people die. And then you look at World War II, and it begins with Germany invading Czechoslovakia, or yeah, Czechoslovakia, um, and then having a, and then having an invasion of Poland. And um, eventually, that escalates into a full-out war. So things tend to begin in the east. So when you see Ukraine and the horrendous map the horrendous surge in nationalism there and not just nationalism not just any nationalism but like straight up nazism that is a sign of very bad things to come and the fact that this nationalist surge in ukraine was backed by nato which isn't really too surprising when you look at the fact that nato has been doing this for decades but the fact that it's being backed by nato and the fact that germany backed Azov Battalion shows you, and Azov Battalion is a Nazi mercenary group, it shows you that, wait a second here, has Germany really changed? Has anything in Europe really changed all that much? Or has the perception of Europe changed? And how, and has the way that, has the way that Europe um, changed its face, has the way that Europe presents itself changed? Well, yes. But has the soul of Europe really changed? Well, if you look at the fact that there's still eugenics in Europe, if you look at the fact that there's still tremendous amounts of nationalism in Europe, and it's rising up in popularity, shows you it hasn't really all that much changed. No, I mean, of course, you could you could you could throw in there that uh, you know, going back to you know the whole LGTB stuff, that's just more. I mean, well, it's always been there, but just more that's reared its ugly head even more than what it already has so I guess that's really the only difference yeah but other than that no it, it really the soul of it really hasn't changed yeah it hasn't changed nothing has changed the only thing that has changed is the face of the whole thing you know it has a face of modernity and progressive being progressive and being it's cleaner race and all that but as soon as uh, the United States gives leeway to Germany to do what it wants, you'll see Germany just go right back to the war path again. And I'm telling you, it is going to happen. And people say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It is going to happen. How do I know this? Because um, war has always plagued Europe. You know, for thousands of years, there have been wars in Europe just as there have been wars in every other continent. But um, Europe has always had wars. And so what makes this generation so special? 
that it's not going to have a war. What makes this generation so morally superior to its predecessors? Exactly. Morally superior to its predecessors. It probably war is actually. So there's nothing there to prevent a war from happening. No. So oh, there's not. There's, well, Germany doesn't have the weapons to have a major war. Well, it has the capacity to make weapons for war, for another war. It has the capacity to make itself militarily advanced. The, the only reason why it hasn't um, fully undergone uh, that uh, that ability to fully under, the, the only reason why it hasn't fully uh, under undergone that uh, that production of, of mass military technology is because it's relied on NATO to do its defense. But right when the United States gives the impression that it doesn't really want to pay for Germany's defense anymore, then Germany will simply use that as an excuse to become a military power again. It's still something of a military power, but not in the same way that it was in the past, but it can definitely go back to that. Yeah. And, and, and actually... Go ahead. I was going to say, well, in, in this generation too, I think the only thing that's different is uh, technology as well, which makes it even more dangerous. It makes it even more dangerous. There's actually a document that you can read from the, um, uh, the they call it on count, not, uh, the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, I believe, in Congress. There's a document from them from 2008 in which they say that if Germany ever gets the impression that the U.S. doesn't want to cover its defense, Germany will, will make nuclear weapons. There's actually a document that says this. So the Americans know this. And so when I see the United States government pushing more and more this idea of Germany paying for its own defense and they're doing it so aggressively, I believe that this is a part of the inner workings of the U.S. government that wants war. And they're saying, well, let's unleash the beast. Let's Let's kind of pull out from this idea of the American security umbrella, let the world do what it wants, and then we'll have a war eventually. Because really the only thing that's keeping the world together from war is the American and Russian uh, poles of power. Yeah, I mean, superpowers. The only superpowers in the world are Russia and the United States. They control the world. And once once the United States becomes lenient on its control, then other countries will want to fill in that vacuum. That's just the way it works. This yeah. is why I'm against the idea of, of, of getting rid of NATO, assembling NATO, because if you remove NATO, then you remove the American control over the world. Yeah, there's and no then, boundaries at that point. Well, what happens is other countries will want to fill in that void. Germany will fill in that void in its own way. Japan yeah. will do that in its own way. Russia will definitely do that. Um, Turkey will do that in its own way. But what I see happening, what I see the U.S. doing now is, is it wants this to happen. That's why you see the U.S. giving so much of a green light to Turkey. You see the U.S. Um, for decades has been backing uh, a, a Japanese power in the East, Far East Asia. Um, you see the United States giving that leniency to Germany, saying you're going to pay for your own defense. These are very dangerous trends that we are doing, and uh, it's not going to lead to anything good. No. Because when you give the green light to Germany and say, well, you should pay for your own defense, Germany's going to say, okay. And they're going to do it. Yeah. So what are you going to do with a, with a militarily independent Germany? What exactly. are you going to do with a militarily independent Jap Japan? And Japan, you know, every year you read these articles about Japan becoming more and more militarily independent, and the United States is, is, is promoting this, it's encouraging this, supposedly to act as a defense against China. The way I see it, though, is you have a state within a state. It's not just, that. when I say the U.S. government, I don't think, you know, your local congressman knows what's happening. It's a state within a state, and most of the people in the U.S. government are not really aware of it. But there is an inner circle within the state that knows exactly what it's doing. Oh, yeah. It's like what happened with Carter. You know, if you bring the Shah to the United States, you're going to have a, a 
and I and I ran a hostage uh, crisis in the U.S. Embassy. Well, they knew that would happen, and they did it anyway. Oh yeah, there's de- uh, there's definitely behind the scene think tanks that uh that are putting this all together for sure. And the same thing happened. The same thing happened with uh, with Nazi Germany. Um, you had people in Wall Street who were backing the Third Reich. They were financing the Third Reich. You know, if you look at um, um, Morgan Stanley of J.P. Morgan, um, Standard Oil, um, ITT, you know, all these big institutions were backing the Nazis in some way, uh, in one way financially and, and, and another way industrially. And they knew exactly what they were supporting. They knew exactly they were supporting a, a very evil regime. They didn't care. They did it anyway because they wanted it to happen so they can make money off of it. Yeah. If there was a war, then all the good reason to support it because in a war, money is to be made. That's why, for example, in World War II, you see technology from ITT being used by the American soldiers and you see technology from ITT being used by the German soldiers. They were making money off both sides. So I think that that inner circle never really went away. It's still here. No. And they are, they're, they were pushing for policy that they want to happen knowing there's going to be violent conflict so they can make money off of it. Well, and in, in World that, War II, in World War II, look what happened here in America. As soon as as soon as that happened, as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, and I know, and I and people can have their own theories of that, you know, the conspiracy theories and all that. Regardless, look at what happened when we entered World War II. Our economy shot straight up. So many jobs were produced out of that. So much uh, income. So you mean to tell me that uh, that they wouldn't want that again? Absolutely, they would. It's like Israel, you know, everyone says, oh, the Israelis, they just want peace, and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, are you sure? I'm sure there are Israelis that do want, and I know there are Israelis who want peace, but, you know, if you look at the inner workings of the Israeli government, do they really want peace? Because as soon as the PLO began to become friendly towards Israel, um, all of a sudden Hamas popped up. Well, what happened there? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The Israeli government created Hamas. That's a fact. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. Well, why would Israel create Hamas? Because they, they, they need a boogeyman. And right when the PLO started to become soft, the Israelis realized, well, we can't use the PLO as propaganda anymore. We need another boogeyman. So they created Hamas. Why, why, why do they want a boogeyman? Because, well, how are you going to, you know, who's, how are you gonna, how are you going to make money off of bombs if you don't have an enemy to bomb? Yeah, and it's it's and, and to and to, my, and to tear I, the I people. Tell my, I tell my neoconservative friends this, and they go crazy, but that's just the reality. No, it is. You, you have to have that. You have to have that boogeyman to have everybody be afraid of. But instead of being, but they're afraid of that boogeyman instead of the real forces that be. And the thing is that um, we are creating enemies right now. You know, even with the Iran situation. People say, oh, Iran is so bad and Iran is this, but America is actually creating a, an Iranian zombie, an Iranian Frankenstein, by saying, well, we need regime change and we need the regime to be replaced by the Mujahideen of Iran. And, and these, these aren't just Democrats saying this, these are Republicans, you know, John Bolton, Gingrich, Giuliani. They're all saying that we should have the Iranian, the people's Mujahideen of Iran replace the current regime. Well, Let's see, the Ayatollah Khomeini is bad, sure, but you want to replace him with the Iranian Mujahideen, just like we backed the Mujahideen of Afghanistan. Again, it proves the policy never changes. It's the same thing. So if we do regime change, and we replace the regime with the, the Iranian, the people's Mujahideen of Iran, it's going to be a lot worse than the Ayatollah Khomeini, I guarantee you. But we are creating the poli- if we actually follow the policy that Bolton wants in Iran, we will actually create a serious Iranian problem. Because right now, Iran is not a threat to the United States. It's not. Um, it's a country that has an economy that is utterly free-falling. It's a very paralyzed with the economy. There's so much economic instability taking place in Iran right now. Um, that And there is there is a, a lot of uh, incentive to have a revolution in Iran. So Iran right now is not a superpower. It's a very paralyzed country. It's a, I guess you could call it a paper dragon. 
But if you have nationalists take over in Iran, which that's what the MEK are, they're Iranian nationalists slash Islamists. If you take, if you allow those people to take over, what eventually would happen is Iran, I believe, this is my theory, Iran would have some sort of an, an industrial revolution, kind of like what Japan had during the, um, in the, in the early, in the early part of the, well, actually no, it is, I want to say in the second half of the 19th century, um, in which Japan transformed itself from being a feudal society to being a unified country with, um, a lot of technological advancement thanks to the West that introduced these things to that country. And that technological um, revolution in, in Japan, that allowed Japan to become a military power that would eventually defeat Russia in the early 1900s and sort of solidify itself as a, as a world power. And I think something like that could happen in Iran, where you will have these nationalists will say, well, we're not like the Ayatollah Khomeini, we're not going to allow the country to become so economically paralyzed. And that, and believe it or not, today there's a lot of hatred for the Ayatollahs in Iran right now because of the economic problems in Iran. There's a lot of people who want to see the Ayatollah gone. So the masses in Iran would follow a nationalist regime, and then because the nationalist regime would be an American puppet, um, there would be commercial dealings between Iran and the West and Iran would be able to become industrially very active, industrially, it would be able to industrially advance itself to like a, to that of a West, to something like a Western country. So it would become technologically a, a serious country. And that's a disaster and waiting to happen. You could actually have like what happened with Japan happen with Iran. And, um, that's what I see. I don't say that's going to happen 100%, but if it does, if you do see regime change in Iran, that's what I see happening. And then you would have that Iranian Frankenstein that we keep hearing about. But right now, with the current state that Iran is in right now, it doesn't have the capacity to become a world power. It doesn't. Well, and also, you know, it's interesting that you bring up regime changes, because I've heard you said this in videos before, but, you know... We in in America, we were all desperate to get rid of, you know, guys like Saddam Saddam Hussein out of Iraq and Gaddafi and so on. And if I, if I'm not mistaken, they the, the Christians in their country were actually well maybe not 100 percent safe, but safer than what people over here would think. Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, that's why I said under Bush, you know, people. People say, under Obama, they were killing all the Christians. Well, they were doing that under Bush. That's why most of the Christians, when Bush was president, left Iraq. Because they were experiencing... After the U.S. invasion in 2003, the Christians began to experience persecution that they had never experienced before. Never. It was something very new to them. And so they were being slaughtered by insurgents. And that was when Bush was president. They were killing people. In fact, there was a, a, a couple days ago, there was a mass grave that was discovered in Iraq by uh, investigators. And I, I don't know how many bodies they found, but I, it was a lot of dead people. And they actually concluded that these bodies were those of victims killed in 2007. Well, who was president in 2007? It wasn't Obama, it was Bush. So it really shows you there were tremendous amounts of massacres happening when Bush was president. That's why the Christians left. Yeah. So, but it, yeah, you're right. Um, the Middle East was better off under these uh, dictators. Because I'm not, US. I'm certainly not calling them saints or anything, but I just remember hearing you say no, that. It. Yeah, I remember hearing hear, hearing about you say that about like Saddam and Gaddafi and Christians actually being somewhat safe in those countries under their regime. That's right, and um, the United States doesn't ca didn't care about that. Um, if you look at some of the things that were being said before the invasion of Iraq, you know there was one statement from a lobbyist. Oh, I forgot what what his name was, but he said something like, "Even if there are no weapons of mass destruction, it wouldn't matter anyway." And you know they said, "Oh, I, you know Saddam, you know Saddam was." was put under inspections. He was made to do inspections for his, for his weapons depot, his chemical weapons um, depot. And 
the Dom removes his chemical weapons. He got rid of them. And um, the people who were inspecting it said, yeah, he, he got rid of it. And for the most part, Saddam was following the rules. And he was, he was doing, he was abiding by the rules and he was allowing inspections to be done in his country. And they were saying, oh no, he's lying. He's not. He really has weapons of mass destruction. Well, they're saying that about Iran right now. You know, they're saying that about Iran right now. And this Iran was going through inspections just like Saddam was going through them. And the people who were doing inspections were saying, oh, Iran is, you know, for the greater part, abiding by the rules. And the lobbyists of war had said Iran is lying. Just like these, these were the same people who were saying that Saddam is lying. Well, are we really going to trust these people? I actually, you know, and I pissed off a lot of people by doing this, but I actually disagreed with Trump, the Trump administration removing the Iran deal. I disagreed with it because I saw parallels between what we did with Iran with what we did with Saddam. Because Saddam was put under, put under inspections, he abided by the inspections, and we said, oh, Saddam is lying, we need regime change. And now these same people are saying the same damn thing about Iran. History is his, that's the thing. History is always going to repeat and, itself. And people say, "Oh no, Iran is really lying." Well, they said the same thing about Iraq. Well, Iraq is different. It's like, well, are you really going to trust these same liars who don't even they're not they're not saying this because they really care about protecting the world from Iranian weapons of mass destruction. They're saying this because they want to justify <clears throat> regime change policy. That is it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't get it. I, I just, you know, you think it would become uh, obvious to people that like by now, like you know, hey, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, chances are that's what it is. But yeah, do you do you really want to be trusting those kind of people that have screwed us over before? We haven't learned anything. This is why I say most people have did not learn the lessons of of what happened with Iraq. Even the Democrats haven't learned anything because. When Bush was president, oh, the Iraq war was bad. But then when regime change policy was being done in Libya under Obama, oh, it was great. But what's the difference? You know, there was no difference. And I'll be so, the and I'll be the first to admit, you know, I'm not the most educated person. I'm not the most articulate person. But even someone like myself can can tell that, you know, if, if it doesn't work the first time, why would you go back to the same? What you think is what you think is the solution. It's like a drug addict. That's why I keep saying politics is like drugs. People who follow politicians are like drug addicts because they say, well, this time it'll be different. This time it'll be different. It's like you look at the past, you look at the record, you say, no, these people did A, B, C, and D, and now they're planning on doing, um, they're planning on doing E, and they're using the same damn strategy they did when they were doing A, B, C, and D. Oh, well, it's different this time. It's not different. It's not different. You know, it's it's funny that. Uh, uh, that uh, they've been talking about overthrowing uh, Maduro in Venezuela, and guess who Trump chose? Well, supposedly Trump chose to oversee the situation in Venezuela. It was Elliot Abrams, and who's Elliot Abrams? Well, he's the same guy that they got to oversee what we were doing in Central America. Yeah. So we get the same guy that we that we commissioned to oversee um, the violent policy that the U.S. was doing in Central America to oversee what's happening in Venezuela. It's like. It's like we're. It's like we have a, uh, a, a protocol that we have for um, for Latin America, and we get the same guys to do it. And yeah. it's interesting that Elliot Abrams is one of the is, was one of the main voices lobbying for the Iraq War as well. So. Yeah, and the fa and the fact, like I said earlier, earl that I said, ugh, tongue tied. I hate that. Um, the fact that it took a Muslim congresswoman to actually see through the bullshit and call him out, and that nobody else could. That that's very telling right there. Yeah. And because she has a hijab, her her opinion means nothing. Also. Yeah. No, she, actually, and I, she was right in what she said about Elliot Abrams, and she was partially right about what she she was partially right about what she said about APAC. Although technically she was mistaken, um, the overall principle is true, and that yeah. is that APAC does have tremendous amounts of power within the U.S. government. So. Yeah, but but because but yeah, I mean, I can't say it enough. Yes, she is a Muslim. Yes, she worships a false a false prophet. But what she said on that 
hundred percent true. And the fact that, yeah. and the fact that it takes, that it takes people like her to call out evils. I mean, it, it is just amazing. It really is. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty scary. Yeah. So, well, look, Ted. Um, I think this is a good place to call it call it quits uh, for this interview. Um, All right. You know, this is a, it was, it was it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think. I know I learned. I know I learned a lot talking to you. I'd like to think my audience did too. Um, and also, I got to bring this up to you before we wrap it up. But uh, a buddy of mine in Chicago, I told him that I was going to be interviewing you, and he actually knew who you were, and he had some positive thoughts about you for sure. I'll say that much. But when I told him that I was going to be interviewing you for my YouTube channel, he goes, "Well, damn, Sean, you're really going for the jugular, aren't you?" Because. <laughs> Well, because because I've in my in past videos, I've spoken out against you know abortion, homosexuality, and all that. Even though my channel is mostly sports, I have talked about that stuff, and I pissed off a lot of people doing it. Um, like I said, I've lost subscribers, friendships, and all that, and so so he knew what I he knew what I stood for, and when, and when I told him that I was interviewing you, and that you know. You know, you you're very outspoken against evil and all that. So he was like, he's like, man, you're really gonna piss off a lot of people, Sean. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, he's absolutely right about that. Yeah. But he, but the joke part is like more towards me, not not you. It's just, right, right. it's just, uh, and you know what? There probably are gonna be a lot of people who don't like what they hear on this video, but that's you know that's fine because as far as I'm concerned, it's truth that people need to hear. I mean, if, and if they can't hear it, they can't stand it, then they're a part of the problem. Absolutely. But, but yeah, Ted, um, it was a, a real pleasure talking to you. Um, I think this went better, better than expected for being a first time journalist. Um, but I want you to know that, uh, you are welcome back on here anytime. If, uh, if you ever have free time and, and Hey, you know, if you're ever, if you're ever out Illinois way, stop on in and I'll, I'll buy you a beer. So as I as I said before, you know we need a lot more people like you in our society that can see through the bull crap, that are not afraid to speak the gospel, speak the truth, speak you know what the Lord commanded all of us to do, and um, and also uh, I I don't ex I didn't I don't expect uh, you to change your mind on Protestants, but I hope you can at least see that not all of us are bad. Oh no, I'm bad. <laughs> I hope I, I hope I haven't got given the impression. No, that no, no. I just, I just, I'm just talking about like, like myself being a member of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. I mean, I know how you feel about Martin Luther. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Martin Luther was a bad, was a bad guy. Uh, like I said, you know, there's a lot of things I need to research more on, but my knowledge is just basically to uh, the basic uh, Luther's Catechism from Confirmation class. Um, but I mean that that's definitely stuff that I'll have to look into. But but yeah, I mean that that's the main thing is just that you know I never thought that you thought Protestants were bad or anything like that. Even though there's some Protestant denominations that are, I just I just you know hope you realize that a lot of us do get what you're talking about. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. At least, oh, well, I, I can't. Well, at least myself anyway. I can't speak for everybody, but but yeah, we can make we can make a show out of it. A Catholic and a Protestant. <laughs> Start start the jokes there. A Catholic and a Protestant walk into a bar. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would say that Catholics and Protestants are probably more united today than they ever have been. Uh, a lot of the old hatreds have kind of gone away. I mean, my my father's side of the family is Catholic. I mean, as I told you earlier, I was I was uh, Catholic the first seven years of my life, baptized in a Catholic church, even though both sides of the family uh, some are kind of slipping. Cause my dad, my dad's actually now a United Methodist, and that's oh, okay. that's a that's a denomination I despise very much. If you saw the recent vote, <laughs> yeah, you, you see, it, was, yeah, was yeah, and the fact that they even had that you even put a, the scriptures to a vote is is a again one of those things that's very telling. Okay, right. yeah, they're just, it's, just, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a white atheist club for white people to get together and. Act like they're religious. It's like the Episcopalians. Yeah, 
and uh, and I found out I found out that the reason. And by the way, just so you know, I am still recording here. But if there's anything that you want me to cut, I can. Fine. But um, um. The funny thing, the thing is, the reason I talked to my dad about this, the reason that he joined was because, uh, see, him and my mom are actually divorced, and I guess, I guess in the in the Catholic Church they want you to get an annulment. Yes. And uh, my dad was like, "Well, I'm not going to get an annulment and say any of my children don't exist." So that's that's why he did, but he, you know, why he joined the United yeah, Methodist. Yeah, I think that Catholic, the Catholic Church can that annulment stuff way too they can be very stringent on it to the point where it's like it, to the point where it's like it's not even necessary to do it but they do it anyway um so for example you could have like let's say a guy let's say a, a catholic woman marries a guy who's not catholic but then later on he converts to catholicism and they'll say well and he says well i want to become a catholic and then they'll say well they don't do that. I, I think they don't. Well, I'm not sure if they do this in like the, in the in the general Catholic in your general Catholic church, but I know that they do do this kind of thing in the more traditional churches, like where they have the Latin Mass. And they'll say things like, "Well, if you want to become a Catholic, then you have to be given an annulment." And say, like, "Well, what does that entail?" And it's like, "Well." Because you weren't Catholic when you got married, and blah blah blah, and it's like, well, like, like you have to get the like. Let's say, okay, I'm, I'm just kind of, kind of got it right here. Don't record this. Part. I can uh, I can cut out whatever. Um. So let's say let's say let's say you have a guy married a Catholic woman, and he, the guy was previously married, and. But he wasn't a Catholic when he got divorced. But then he married this woman, and then later on becomes a Catholic, wants to become a Catholic. And they'll say, "Well, you have to, you have to get the annulment for the previous marriage." And it's like, "Well, I wasn't Catholic during the previous marriage." Well, it doesn't matter. You have to get, you have to get an annulment. And it's like, "Well, I want to become a Catholic." We well, can't become a Catholic until you get an annulment. So, well, what does that, what does that involve? Well, it involves us talking to your ex-wife about all this, and it just brings up a whole can of worms up. And I really don't agree with that stringency. I think. It could be too much. So when when Pope Francis came along and said, "Hey, you know, divorced Catholics can get communion," tra you know, trads were making this huge freaking deal about it, and it just kind of it was really annoying just to hear all the trads going off about, "Oh, hey, well, divorced people can get can get can get um, communion." It's like, yeah, okay, you know, it's like people screw up in their past. Yeah. I mean, yes, divorce America, is a sin. We know that. Divorce twice and three times in America, and there's so much of it. What are you gonna do? You're gonna, you're gonna like, if, some, if someone is willing to become Catholic, and you say, well, you cannot become Catholic until we interview your ex-wife, until we interview all the other people, and literally do an inquisition on you. That's what it is. It's an inquisition. Yeah. That to me is is. It's like what Jesus said, you know, you you don't let people in through the door. You you impede people from entering, is what Jesus told the Pharisees, and that's what these people are doing. And so when 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 Francis comes along and says, you know, we can make it easier for divorced people to take communion, I had no issue with that at all. They were people acting like he was the Antichrist, and he, you know, and, and what's funny is that the people who made a big deal about it. These are the same types of people who would praise Milo. Yeah. It's it's hypocrisy, but um, you know, a pope doing something like that is not really unusual. Um, in the time of Tertullian, which is like 200 years after Christ, uh, the pope in his day—I forgot his name—but the pope in his day made an edict saying that women who were promiscuous could come in and could come to the church and have their sins forgiven. And um, I, for, I forgot exactly what he said. He said something like they could have their sins forgiven without a heavy a heavy um, penance or something like that. Yeah. And Tertullian made a huge deal about it, and that ended up – Tertullian ended up leaving the Catholic Church over it and, and joining a heretical sect. 
Yeah. And so I think he ended up becoming a Montanist or something. And so people can get really caught up in this and act like Francis is the worst pope ever and, and everything he's done is so different from what the Catholic Church has done in the past. It's like, as far as him giving um, amnesty to divorced people, it, it's it's not like he's out of his authority when he does that. He's within his authority to do that. Mm-hmm. And I, I really had no issue with it at all. Um, to be honest, I don't think he's the worst pope that we've had. Um, people think, oh, he's so bad and he's so this and he's so that. We've had popes in the past who were pretty corrupt. And I'm, I'm not talking about uh, 1960s. I'm talking about 1500s, 1400s, you know. Um, so it's, I, think, I think people blow Francis out of proportion and make him what he really is. Mm. That's my opinion. I mean, uh, yeah, there's, there's, certain, there's definitely valid criticism for him, but I think people take that and they, they apply it to extreme interpretations or they use it, they, they, they take, they take things about him and they expand it to, to its most, to its most extreme, um, label and say, well, he's a communist and, and all that. And it's like, there's no evidence that he's a communist. Yeah. And but yeah, I just uh, like with going back with my dad and all that. It's like, okay, I, I understand you want to take communion and all that, but really, that's what you choose. That yeah, you know. Methodism, yeah, that's not a very good route. Now, I've I've been to a, a, a United Methodist service and yeah, uh, run for the hills, people. Yeah, I have actually. You know, I went to a Methodist church many years ago. I not to, I spoke there. It was for a it was for an event that I that I was there to speak in, uh, but I wasn't there as a congregant. Yeah, and that, and that and that's the thing, you know, like in the here in the LCMS that I'm a part of. I mean, you can, yeah, um, you can go to other services, but yeah, you can't. Like you said, you can't. We can't participate. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I don't really know where I was going with that. I'm kind of getting, <laughs> you know, a little uh, brain tied, I guess you'd call it. But um, but yeah, um, I think I think this was definitely a a good first interview, Ted. And you know, even though I tried to end this video like five minutes ago, it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you again so much for coming on and agreeing to come on. Uh, I know that I'm not exactly a, a big publication. A mere like 650 subscribers, but I think I think that's yeah, probably I think that's probably 650 people that probably never knew who you were. So I, I you know, yeah. you're in demand. You're in demand, my friend. <laughs> Maybe not well, me. I, 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 I hope I don't become too famous. I, I really don't want to become famous um, because when you become famous, uh, you, you really can't go out anywhere without people, you know, spitting on you. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm too famous. Have you ever had that happen to you? Uh, someone recognize you from doing your videos and stuff? Have, has anybody yeah. ever come up to you and said, "Hey, look, it's Theodore Shubot"? Yeah, a few times actually, it's happened. Have they it's, been? Have, uh, have they been, been peaceful? Yeah. What's that? I, I was just gonna ask if they've been peaceful encounters or if it was people that didn't yeah, like I've you. Yeah, I've never had any bad encounters. I've never had people say, "Oh, you, oh there's that guy." Uh, every encounter that I've had has been peaceful. Yeah. Um, went to the airport I remember and some hey I, I've seen your videos and then I remember going into a restaurant it was an In-N-Out burger and two guys approached me and said oh I watch your videos all the time and it's happened a number of times yeah happened a number of times that's awesome well I got, and I gotta tell you one thing uh, obviously I'm not like I said, I'm not a major publication, but believe it or not, from the stuff that I have done on here that are non-sports, I've actually gotten two death threats. So I must be doing something right. Yeah. Well, with that said, Ted, um, thank you again so much for coming to my channel. Um, it was a treat for me. I hope it's a treat to most of my viewers. And one last thing. Um, before, sure. before people go... But before people, I know people are likely going to see this video. They're going to go Google your name, and the first thing that'll probably pop up is something from Right Wing Right Wing Watch or some joke like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is something? What is one last thing that you want my audience to know about you before they decide to do that? One of the things that I really wish people would know 
about me is that I'm not a right winger. I really wish that I, and I really hate when people call me a right winger because for years I have been exposing the what we call the right, and I've exposed I've I actually exposed them more than I have done the left, um, and I've spent most of my time exposing the groups that we would call right wing more than I have more than I have the groups that we would call left wing. The reason why I say well. The reason why I call them the groups that we call right is because I think the right and left wing dichotomy is kind of an illusion. I think both sides lead to the same thing. Um, and some people are more vicious than others. Um, but I really wish I, people would not look at me as right wing. I think to me that's like the biggest insult ever is to call me a right winger. Um, I've had people call me a Bible thumper, Bible humper, Jesus, you know freak or whatever but when someone calls me a right winger it's like no no don't call me that I've always I've tried my best to fight I've, I've tried my best to stop people from perceiving me as that and not to give out that impression um, and that's one of the reasons why when I say socialism I always say like Marxist socialism or national socialism because I don't want to be like these guys who say socialism because socialism isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's done in a proper way uh, and it's done not in, and not in a way that is uh, tyrannical and it's done for good reasons and it's done within a within a society that allows for people to make their own money as well and not be you know controlled or anything like that fully controlled um, that's why I always specify Marxist socialism or national socialism because, like I said, not all socialism is bad. You need some socialism, and you need some capitalism as well. You need a balance between the two. So I, I really wish that I, people wouldn't see me as right wing. Okay, and that's something that I've definitely seen out of you, Ted. I, th I, you know, you were definitely a very balanced person. Um, you really are Thank true. You. you really are true to the scriptures and to the faith, and you're not. You don't bullshit people. You know, you don't scam people. No. You don't. I, you know, you... No, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I don't believe in um, exaggerating things. Um, I try to give a balanced approach as best as I can, and um, I you... always try to set that standard on myself. You tell people what they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. Yeah, well, I, what I do is I is I look at okay, what are the idols that people are bowing down to right now? Okay, let's address them. I mean, that's really that's really that really has been my philosophy since I began writing. It was, what do people worship? And let's, let's overturn the idols. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, you, let's, let's throw them out. You show the people that, you show the evils to people that are right in front of their faces and they don't even know. It's the most deceptive evils too. The ones that, that come across as the most Christian are the ones that I will attack the most. Or the ones that come across as the most conservative are the ones that I will attack the most because those are the ones that are deceiving people. Let's not forget Jesus said that the Antichrist will deceive even the very elect. Well, how do you deceive the very elect unless you act like you are a member of the elect? Yeah. That's so. perfect. That's a, that's a perfect place to end it. Um, so, Ted, I'm going to steal one of your lines here, but um, thank, thank you again for being on. And um, with that, with with that said, for Theodore Schubot, this is Andy Sean Forty Five signing off. And Ted, I'm going to steal one of your lines. God bless, and God be with all of us. Amen.